Section 40 of the Letters of Madame de Sévigné to her daughter and friends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Letter 9. Wednesday, December the 17th, 1664. You languish, my dear friend, after intelligence, and so do we. I'm sorry I sent you word that judgment would be pronounced on tuesday for not hearing from me you must have thought it was all over but our hopes are as strong as ever i informed you on saturday in what way monsieur domisson had reported the cause and how he had voted but i did not sufficiently express the extraordinary esteem he has acquired by his conduct in this business I have heard several of this profession say that his speech was a masterpiece, that he explained himself with great clearness and rested his opinion upon the most convincing arguments. It was eloquence and grace combined. In short, no man ever had a finer opportunity of making himself known, and no man ever made a better use of it. If he had wished to open his door to congratulations the house would have been crowded but he was too modest for this and kept out of the way his colleague saint hélène indignant at his success spoke on monday and tuesday he resumed the affair weakly and miserably reading what he had to say without adding any new circumstance or giving a different turn to it he voted but did not assign his reasons that Monsieur Fouquet should lose his head for his crime against the state. To gain votes on his side, he played the Norman, and alleged that it was probable the king, who alone could do it, would remit the sentence and pardon him. It was yesterday he performed this brilliant action, which we were as much grieved as we had before been satisfied with the conduct of Monsieur Domisson. This morning Puissot spoke for four hours, but with so much vehemence, fury, rage and rancour that several of the judges were shocked, and it is thought his intemperance will do more good than harm to our poor friend. He even redoubled his violence towards the end and said upon the subject of the crime against the state, that the example of a certain Spaniard, who had so great a horror for a rebel, that he ordered his house to be burned because Charles de Bourbon had passed through it, ought to make us blush at our moderation, that we had much greater reason to hold in abhorrence the crime of Monsieur Fouquet, that the halter and the gibbet were the only proper punishments for him, but that in consideration of the high offices he had held and the noble families to which he was related, he would relax his opinion and vote with Monsieur de saint Hélène that he be beheaded. What say you to this moderation? Is it because he is the uncle of Monsieur de Nesmond and was accepted against that he conducts himself so generously? For my part, I can scarcely contain myself when I think of this scandalous proceeding. I do not know whether judgment will be pronounced tomorrow or the business be protracted to the end of the week. We have still many difficulties to encounter, but perhaps someone will side with Monsieur Dormisson. His opinion at present stands alone but I have to beg your attention to two or three little incidents which are no less extraordinary than true. In the first place, then, a comet made its appearance about four days ago. It was announced at first by some women only, who were laughed at for their pains, but it has now been seen by everyone. Monsieur D'Artagnan sat up last night and saw it very distinctly. Monsieur de Neuret a great astronomer, says it is of a considerable magnitude. Monsieur Dufresne has seen it with three or four other learned men. I have not seen it myself, 
but I intend sitting up tonight for the purpose. It appears about three o'clock. I tell you of this, ignorant, whether you will be pleased or displeased with the intelligence. Berrier, in the literal sense of the word, is become mad. He has been bled profusely and is in a perfect frenzy. He raves of wheels and gibbets, and has even mentioned particular trees. He declares he's going to be hanged and makes so dreadful a noise that his keepers are obliged to chain him. This is evidently a judgment of providence and a very just one. A criminal of the name of La Motte, who was in prison and about to be tried, has disposed that Messrs. de B. Dot, 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 C. Dot, 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 and B. Dot, 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 they add also Puisseau or Ponce, but of him I'm not so certain. Footnote, Monsieur Bouchra was one of the commissioners. The other B. Dot, dot, dot is no doubt Berrier, back to main text, deposed, that they urged him several times to implicate Monsieur Pouquet and Lorme, promising, if he would do so, that they would obtain his pardon. But he refused and published the circumstance in court before his trial took place. He was condemned to the galleys. The wife and mother of Monsieur Fouquet have procured a copy of the deposition and will present it tomorrow at the chamber. Perhaps it will not be received because the judges are now giving their opinions. But it may be made known and must produce a strong impression on the court. Is not all this very extraordinary? I must tell you also of a heroic act of Musma. He had been dangerously ill for a whole week of a bladder complaint. He took a variety of medicines and was at last bled at midnight. The next morning at seven o'clock, he insisted on being carried to the Chamber of Justice where he suffered the most excruciating pain. The Chancellor saw him turn pale and said, this is not a fit place for you, sir. You had better retire. True, sir, he replied. But I may as well die here. The Chancellor, perceiving him ready to faint and finding him bent upon remaining, said, Well, sir, retire. We will wait for you. Upon this he went out for a quarter of an hour, during which time he passed two stones of so enormous a size that it might be considered as a miracle, if men were deserving that God should work miracles in their favour. This worthy man then returned into court, gay and cheerful, everyone astonished at the adventure. This is all I know. Everybody is interested in this weighty affair. Nothing else is talked of. Men reason, infer, calculate, pity, fear, wish, hate, admire, are overwhelmed. In short, my dear sir, our present situation is a most singular one. But the resignation and firmness of our dear unfortunate friend is perfectly heavenly. He knows every day what passes and every day volumes might be written in his praise. I beg you to thank your father, footnote, Anno Dondilly, the translator of Josephus' back to main text, for the gratifying note he has written me, and the charming works he sent me. I have read them, though my head feels, alas, as if it was split into pieces. Tell him I am delighted he loves me a little, a great deal, I mean, and that I love him still more. I have received your last letter. Alas, you overpay so abundantly the trifling services I render you that I remain your debtor. Letter 10, Friday, December the 19th, 1664. This is a day which gives us great hopes, but I must go back in my story. 
I told you that Monsieur Puissot had, on Wednesday, voted for the death of our friend. On Thursday, Nog, Isocor, Ferriol and Perrault voted in the same way. Roxant concluded the day, and after speaking well for an hour, sided with Monsieur Dormisson. This morning our hopes have sailed before the wind, for several votes that were doubtful have been given. Poisson, Masnon, Rerier, Labaume and Catenet, and all in favour of Monsieur Domisson's opinion. Footnote names of the committee who judged Fouquet. Favourable Domisson de Ferron, Moussy, Briac, Renard, Bernard, Roxon, La Troison, Labaume, Verrier, Masnon, Catenet, Pontchartrain. Adverse Saint Hélène, Prissot, Chisoko, Ferriol, Nogue, Ero, Ponce, Proseguier, the Chancellor. Back to main text. It was then Ponce's turn to speak, but thinking that those who remained were almost all disposed to be lenient, he would not begin, though it was only eleven o'clock. It is thought he wishes to consult with someone what he shall say and that he is not willing to bring disgrace upon himself and consign a man to death unnecessarily. Such is our present situation, and though so favourable a one, our joy is not complete. For we must know that M. H. is so enraged that we expect some unjust and atrocious proceeding in consequence that will plunge us again into despair. Reader's note, M. H. is Colbert, back to main text. But for this, my dear sir, we should have the satisfaction of seeing our friend, though unfortunate, yet safe as far as his life is concerned, which is a great thing. We shall see what will happen tomorrow. We are now seven to six. Le Ferron, Moussy, Briac, Bernard, Rena, Voisin, Pontchartrain, and the Chancellor have not yet voted, but of these we shall see by far the greater number. Saturday. Fall on your knees, sir, and return thanks to God. The life of our poor friend is saved. Thirteen were in Monsieur Domisson's opinion, and nine of Saint Helene's. I'm almost wild with joy. Sunday evening. I was sadly afraid some other person would have the pleasure of communicating to you the joyful tidings. My courier was not very diligent. He said on setting out that he would sleep nowhere but at Livre. He assures me, however, he was the first that arrived. Heavens, how gratifying must the intelligence have been to you! How inconceivably sweet! are the moments that relieve the heart on a sudden from the anguish of so painful a suspense. It will be a long time before I shall lose the joy I received yesterday. It was in reality too great, too much almost for me to bear. The poor man learnt the news by signals a few moments after judgment was pronounced, and I dare say felt it in all its extent. This morning, the king sent the Chevalier de Gouet to the mother and wife of Monsieur Fouquet, recommending them both to go to Montluçon in Auvergne. The Marquis and Marchioness de Charot to Ancigny, and the young Fouquet to Joinville in Champagne. The good old lady sent word to the king that she was 72 years of age, that she besought his majesty not to deprive her of her only remaining son, the support of her life, which apparently was drawing near its close. The prisoner does not yet know his sentence. It is said he will be taken tomorrow to Pignerol, for the king has changed his banishment into imprisonment. His wife, contrary to all rule, is not permitted to see him. But let not this proceeding abate the least particle of your joy. Mine, if possible, is increased. 
for I see in this more clearly the greatness of our victory. I shall faithfully relate to you the sequel of this curious history. I have given you what has passed today, the rest tomorrow. Tuesday evening. This morning at ten o'clock, Monsieur Fouquet was conducted to the chapel of the Bastille. Foucault held the sentence in his hand. You must tell me your name, sir, said he, that I may know whom I address. Monsieur Fouquet replied, You know very well who I am, and as for my name, I will not give it here, as I refuse to give it at the Chamber of Justice. By the same rule also, I protest against the sentence you are going to read to me. What passed being written down, Hoko put on his hat and read the sentence. Monsieur Fouquet heard it uncovered. Peque and La Vallée footnote his physician and his servant back to main text were afterwards separated from him, and the cries and tears of these poor men melted every heart that was not of iron. They made so strange a noise that Monsieur d'Artagnan was obliged to go and comfort them, for it seemed to them as if a sentence of death had just been read to their master. They were both lodged in the Bastille, and it is not known what will be done with them. Monsieur Fouquet went to the apartment of Monsieur d'Artagnan. While he was there, he saw Monsieur Domisson, who came for some papers that were in the hands of Monsieur d'Artagnan, pass by the window. On perceiving him, Monsieur Fouquet saluted him with an open countenance expressive of joy and gratitude. He even cried out to him that he was his humble servant. Monsieur Domisson returned the salutation with very great civility and came with grief of heart to tell me what had passed. At eleven o'clock, a coach was ready, into which Monsieur Fouquet entered with four guards. Monsieur d'Artagnan was on horseback with fifty musketeers. He will escort him to Pignerol, where he will leave him in prison, in the care of a man of the name of Saint-Marc, who is a very honest fellow. He will have fifty soldiers to guard his prisoner. I do not know whether another servant has been allowed our friend... You can form no idea how cruel the circumstance of taking Pequin Lavelle from him appears to everyone. Some even go so far as to draw dreadful inferences from it. May God preserve him, as he has hitherto done. In him we must put our trust, and leave our friend to the protection of that providence which has been so gracious to him. They still refuse him his wife, but have permitted the mother to remain at Park with the abbess, her daughter. Nequia will follow his sister-in-law. He has declared that he has no other means of subsistence. Readers note the grand squire of France, brother of Bouquet, back to main text. Monsieur and Madame de Charost are going immediately to Ancy. Monsieur Bay, the Attorney General, has been turned out of office for having said to Gisocourt before the judgment was pronounced that he ought to retrieve the honour of the Grand Council, which would be disgraced if C. Dot, 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 Ponce and himself acted together in the business. I'm sorry for this upon your account. It is a rigorous measure. Tantene animis celestibus irae. Footnote Virgil's Aeneid, Book 1, Reader's Note, Can such anger dwell in celestial souls? Back to main text. But no, it does not mount so high as that. Such harsh and low revenge cannot proceed from a heart like that of our monarchs. His name is employed, and as you see, profaned. I will let you know the rest. How much better could we converse upon these things it is impossible to communicate by letter all we have to say. Adieu, my dear sir. I have not so much modesty as you, and 
without taking refuge in the crowd, I assure you, I love and esteem you highly. I have seen the comet. Its train is of a beautiful length. I partly found my hopes on it. A thousand compliments to your dear wife. Tuesday. I send you something to amuse you for a few minutes. You will certainly find it worth reading. It is charity to entertain you both in your solitude. If the friendship I bear the father and son were a remedy against dullness, it is an evil of which you would never have to complain. I am just come from a place where it seems I have renewed this sentiment by talking of you with five or six persons, male and female, who, like me, rank themselves among your friends. It was at the Hôtel de Nevers. Your wife was of the party. She will tell you of the delightful little comedians we met there. I believe our dear friend is arrived, but I have no certain intelligence. It is only known that Monsieur d'Artagnan, continuing his obliging manners, gave him the necessary fur clothing that he might pass the mountains without inconvenience. I know also that Monsieur d'Artagnan has received letters from the king, and that he told Monsieur Fouquet to keep up his spirits and his courage, and that everything would go well. We are always looking forward to some mitigation, and I in particular. Hope has been too kind for me to abandon it. Whenever I see the king at our ballets, these two lines of Tasso come into my head. Goffredo ascolta e in riger sembianza Borghe più de timor che de speranza. Footnote, Godfrey attends, and with a brow severe, but little gives to hope and much to fear. Hull's translation, back to main text. But I care not to despond, and we must follow the example of our poor prisoner. He is tranquil and gay. Let us be so too. It will give me real pleasure to see you here. I cannot think your exile will be of long duration. Assure your good father of my affection. I cannot help expressing myself thus. And let me know your opinion of the stanzas. Some of them are admired, as well as some of the couplets. Reader's note. Some of the numerous verses that were made at that time in favour of Fouquet and against his enemies, back to main text. Letter 11, Thursday evening, January 1665. At length the mother, the daughter-in-law and the brother have obtained leave to be together. They are going to Mont Luçon in the heart of Auvergne. The mother had permission to go to Parc aux Dames to her daughter, but her daughter-in-law has prevailed on her to accompany her. Monsieur and Madame de Charost are on the way to Ansny. Piquet and La Vallée are still in the Bastille. Can anything be more dreadful than this injustice? They have given Monsieur Fouquet another servant. It is said that the person who is to have the care of him at Pignerol is a very worthy creature. God grant he may be so. Or rather, God protect our friend. He has already protected him so visibly that we ought to think he has an especial care of him. La Forêt, his old esquire, accosts at him as he was going away. I'm delighted to see you, said Fouquet to him. I know your fidelity and affection. Tell my wife and mother not to despair, that my courage remains, and that I'm in good health. Is not this admirable? Adieu, my dear sir, let us be like him. Let us have courage. 
and dwell on the joy occasioned by the glorious sentence of Saturday. Madame de Grignon is dead. Footnote Angélique Claire d'Angène, Monsieur de Grignon's first wife. Back to main text. Friday evening. It seems by your thanks as if you were giving me my dismissal, but I will not receive it yet. I intend to write to you whenever I please, and as soon as I have the verses from the Pont Neuf, I shall send them to you. Readers know Pont Neuf was a name given to popular songs composed to well-known airs. A great number of them had been composed about the trial of Fouquet, back to main text. Our dear friend is still upon the road. It was reported that he had been ill. Everybody exclaimed, what, already? It was reported also that Monsieur Dattinon had sent to court to know what he was to do with his sick prisoner, and that he had been answered unfeelingly that he must proceed with him, however ill he might be. This is all false but it shows the general feeling and the danger of furnishing materials with which to build whatever horrid castles we please. Fecke and Lavene are still in the Bastille. This conduct is truly unaccountable. The chamber will be resumed after the Epiphany. I should think the poor exiles must be arrived ere this at the place of their destination. When our poor friend has reached his, I will inform you, for we must follow him to Pignerol. Would to God we could bring him thence to the place we wish. Footnote. It was the general opinion that Fouquet died in prison in the year 1680. See Le siècle de Louis the Fourteenth and the note at the beginning of the letter dated April the 3rd, 1680. Back to main text. And how much longer, my dear sir, will be your exile? I often think of this. A thousand compliments to your father. I have been told your wife is here. I shall call upon her. I supped last night with one of your lady friends, and we talked of paying you a visit. End of section 40。section 41 of the letters of Madame de Savigny to her daughter and friends。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。letters to her son the Marquis de Savigny。footnote。this only son of Madame de Savigny inherited neither her genius。her virtues, nor her energy of character. She treated him always with great kindness, but was never blind to his faults. Her judicious management seems to have had a salutary effect upon him after the follies of his youth were over. He reformed in a measure, and in 1684 married Jeanne-Marguerite de Brennan de Moron of a noble and rich family. This alliance was a great joy to Madame de Savigny, and it is to the illness of this beloved daughter-in-law that she alludes in the second letter. Letter 1. Paris, August the 5th, 1684. While I'm expecting your letters, I must relate to you a very amusing little history. You remember how much you regretted Mademoiselle de dot dot dot? and how unfortunate you thought yourself in having missed her for a wife. Your best friends had all conspired against your happiness. Madame de Lavardin, Madame de Lafayette had done you irreparable injury. A young lady of noble birth, great beauty, and ample fortune was lost to you. Surely a man must be doomed never to marry, and to die like a beggar, to let such an opportunity escape him when it was in his own power. The Marquis de Dash, Dash, Dash was not such a fool. He has made his fortune and is settled. You must certainly have been born under an unlucky planet to miss such a match. 
only observe her conduct. She is a saint, an example to all married women. You remember all this, I suppose, my dear son, and that till you married Mademoiselle de Moron, you were ready to hang yourself. You could not have done better than you have done, but now for the sequel. All those amiable qualities of her youth, which made Madame de Lafayette say she would not have her for a daughter-in-law if she could bring millions to her son, were happily directed to the service of religion. God was her lover, the only object of her affection. All her desires centred in this single passion. But as everything was in extremes with her, her poor head could not bear the excess of zeal and fervent devotion with which it was filled, and to satisfy the overflowings of her Magdalen heart, she resolved to profit by good examples, by reading the lives of the Holy Fathers of the Desert and of female penitents. She wished to become herself the heroine of such admirable histories, and full of this idea, left her house and family about a fortnight ago, and taking with her only five or six pistols and a little footboy, set out at four o'clock in the morning, and, taking a post-chaise at the skirts of the town, drove to Rouen, fatigued and covered with mud. When she got there, she bargained for a passage in a ship bound for the Indies. It was there, it seems, God had called her. It was there she was to lead a life of penitence and humiliation. It was there the map had pointed out to her an abode which invited her to pass the rest of her days in sackcloth and ashes. It was there the Abbe Zosimus was to visit her and administer to her the last holy rites before she expired. But no, Zosimus was a famous hermit of the 6th century who came on the eve of every Good Friday to give the sacrament to St. Mary the Egyptian in a desert cave on the banks of the River Jordan. See the lives of the fathers of the desert back to main text. Satisfied with this resolution, and convinced that heaven inspired her with it, she discharged her footboy and sent him home to his own country, while she waited with great impatience the departure of the ship. Her good angel consoled her for the delay. She piously forgot husband, daughter, father and relations, exclaiming, Ça, courage, mon cœur, point de faiblesse humaine. Footnote, courage, my heart disdain all human weakness. Back to main text. And now the moment arrived in which her prayers are heard, the happy moment that was to separate her forever from her native land. She follows the law of the gospel. She leaves all to follow Christ. In the meantime, however, her family missed her, and finding she did not return to dinner, sent to all the churches in the neighbourhood, she was not there. They supposed she would return at night. No tidings were heard of her. They now begin to be uneasy. The servants are all questioned. They can give no account of her further than that she had taken her footboy with her. She must certainly be at her country house. No. Where can she possibly be? A messenger is dispatched to the curé of Saint-Jacques-de-Aupas, and the curé says he has not had the direction of her conscience for a considerable time. For being a simple, honest man, and having observed her full of strange chimerical ideas of religion, he would have nothing to do with her. Everyone was now at a loss what to think. Two, three, four days, a week passed. Still no news of her. At length her friends thought of sending to some seaports, and by mere accident found her at Rouen on the point of setting out for Dieppe, and from thence to the other extremity of the globe. They secure her and bring her back, a little disconcerted at being disappointed of her journey. J'allais, j'étais, l'amour a ce moi trente d'empire. Good night I went, I came, impelled by mighty love back to main text. 
a lady to whom she had imparted her design revealed the whole to her family who in despair at her folly would fain have concealed it from her husband who happened to be absent from paris at that time and who would have been better pleased at an exploit of gallantry in his amiable consort than such a ridiculous expedition as this the husband's mother came to madame de lavardin and bathed in tears related the whole story while the latter could scarcely refrain from laughing in her face and the next time she saw my daughter asked her if she could forgive her for having been the instrument of preventing her brother from marrying this pretty creature madame de lafayette was also in her turn informed of this tragical story and repeated it to me with great glee she desires me to ask if you are still angry with her she maintains that no one can ever repent he did not marry a mad woman we dare not mention a syllable of this to mademoiselle de grignon her friend footnote sister of count de grignon back to main text who for some time past has been ruminating upon a pilgrimage and as a preparative has lately observed a profound silence towards us all what think you of this curious narration has it tired you are you satisfied now adieu my son Marshal de Schomberg is marching to Germany at the head of 25,000 men to hasten the Emperor's signing. The Gazette will inform you of the rest. Adieu. Footnote. This relates to the truce which was on the point of being concluded at Ratisbon and was published at Paris on the 5th of October following. Back to main text. Grignon, September the 20th, 1695. And so you are at our poor rocks, my dear children, experiencing there the sweets of tranquillity, exempt from all duties and all fatigues, and our dear little marchioness can breathe again. Good heavens, how well you described to me her situation and her extreme delicacy. I am so affected at it, and I enter so affectionately into your ideas that my heart is oppressed and tears rush into my eyes. It is to be hoped that you will only have the merit of bearing your sorrows with resignation and submission. But if God should appoint otherwise, like all unforeseen events, it would turn out differently from your expectations. I will believe, however, that this dear being will last with care as long as any one. We have a thousand examples of recovery. Has not Mademoiselle de la Trousse? suffered from almost every kind of disorder in the meantime my dear child i enter into your feelings with infinite affection and from the bottom of my heart you do me justice when you say you are afraid of affecting me too much by relating to me the state of your mind it does indeed affect me be assured i feel for you keenly i hope this letter will find you calmer and happier paris seems to be quite out of your thoughts on account of our marchioness you are thinking only of bourbon in the spring continue to inform me of your plans do not leave me in ignorance of anything that concerns you give me an account of the letters of the twenty third and thirtieth of august there was also a note for Galois, which I desired Monsieur Branchon to pay. Give me an answer upon this subject. The good Branchon is married. He has written me a very charming letter upon the occasion. Let me know whether the match is as good as he represents it to be. The lady is related to all the Parliament and to Monsieur Daroui. Explain this to me, my child. I also addressed a letter to you for our Abbe Charrier. He will be sorry not to see you again. And Monsieur de Toulon. You express yourself well respecting this ox. It is for him to tame him and for you to stand firm where you are. Return the Abbe's letter to Campoli. With regard to your poor sister's health, it is not at all good. It is no longer her loss of blood that alarms us, for that is over. 
but she does not recover her strength. She is still so much altered that you would hardly know her, because her stomach does not regain its tone, and no food seems to nourish her. This arises from the bad state of her liver, of which you know she has long complained. It is so serious an evil that I am really alarmed at it. Remedies might be used for her liver, but they are unfavourable to the loss of blood, which we are in continual apprehension may return, and which has produced a bad effect upon the afflicted part. These two maladies, which require opposite medicines, reduce her to a truly pitiable situation. Time, we hope, will repair this devastation. I sincerely wish it. And if we enjoy this blessing, we shall go to Paris with all expedition. This is the point to which we are arrived, and which must be cleared up. I will be very faithful in my communications. This languor makes us say little yet of the return of the warriors. I do not doubt, however, that the business will be concluded. Readers note that the business is the marriage of Pauline de Grignon, and the Marquis de Simian, to be celebrated at the return of the Marquis who was with the army, back to the main text. It is too far advanced, but it will be without any great joy, and even if we go to Paris, they would set out two days after to avoid the air of a wedding and visits which they wish not to receive. A burnt child, etc. Readers note, a burnt child fears the fire. Madame de Savigny's expression is a scalded cat fears cold water. Back to main text. As to Monsieur de saint Armand's grief, of which such a parade has been made at Paris, readers note, Madame de Grignon had arranged the marriage of her son, the Marquis de Grignon, with the daughter of the wealthy tax farmer saint Armand, to retrieve the ruinous financial situation of the Grignons. She had presented her daughter-in-law at court with gestures of disdain, and according to Saint-Simon, had said that it was necessary at times to add fertiliser to the land. The family of her daughter-in-law never forgave her. Back to main text. As to Monsieur saint Amand's grief, of which such a parade has been made at Paris, it was founded upon my daughter's having really proved, by memorandums, which she has showed to us all, that she paid her son 9,000 francs out of the 10 she had promised him, and having in consequence sent him only 1,000, Monsieur de saint Amand said he was cheated, that they wanted to take advantage of him, and that he would give no more, having already given the 15,000 francs of his daughter's portion, which he laid out at Paris in stock, and for which he has the estates that were given up to him here and that the Marquis must seek for assistance in that quarter. You may suppose that when that quarter has paid, it may occasion some little chagrin, but it is at an end. Monsieur de saint Amand thought in himself that it would not be advisable to quarrel with my daughter, so he came here as gentle as a lamb, wishing for nothing but to please and to take his daughter back with him to Paris which he has done, though in good truth she ought to have waited for us, but the advantage of being in the same house with her husband in that beautiful mansion of Monsieur de saint Amand, of being handsomely lodged, of living sumptuously at no expense, made my daughter consent without hesitation to accept all these comforts. But we did not see her depart without tears, for she is very amiable, and was so much affected at bidding us adieu, that it could scarcely have been supposed she was going to a life of pleasure in the midst of plenty. She had become very fond of our society. She set out with her father on the first of this month. Be assured, my son, that no Grignon intends you harm, that you are beloved by all, and that if this trifle has been a serious thing, they would have felt that you would have taken as much interest in it as you have done. 
Monsieur de Grignon is still at Versailles, we expect him shortly, for the sea is clear, and Admiral Russell, who is no longer to be seen, will give him leave to come here. Reader's note, Admiral Russell had taken a fleet into the Mediterranean, and for the first time a British fleet was to spend the winter there, back to main text. I shall seek for the two little writings you mention. I rely much upon your taste. The letters to Monsieur de la Trappe are books we cannot send, though in manuscript. You shall read them at Paris, where I still hope to see you, for I love you in a much greater degree than you can love me. It is the order of nature, and I do not complain. I enclose you a letter from Madame de Chambre, which I send to you entire from confidence in your prudence. You will justify yourself in things to which you well know what answer to make, and will pay no attention to those that may offend you. I have said for myself all I had to say, waiting for your answer, respecting what I did not know, and I added that I would inform you of what the Duchess told me. Write to her, therefore, candidly, as having learned from me what she writes respecting you. After all, you should preserve this connection. They love you and have rendered you service. You must not wound gratitude. I have said that you owed obligations to the intendant. But to you, my child, I say, is this friendship incompatible with your ancient leagues with the first president and the attorney general? Is it necessary that you should break with your old friends for the sake of securing an intendant? Monsieur de Pomereux did not exact such conduct. I have also said that you ought to be heard, and that it was impossible you should have neglected to congratulate the Attorney General upon the marriage of his daughter. In short, my child, defend yourself, and tell me what you say, that I may second you. End of section 41 Section 42 of the Letters of Madame de Sévigny to her daughter and friends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Letters to the Count de Grignon from 1610 to 1696. It is note that the selection ends in 1675. Good the Count de Guignon was of an ancient and noble Provencal family. He was rich and held a high office, that of Lieutenant General of the Government of Provence. And as the Governor, von Dome, was rarely in his place, Monsieur de Guignon was virtually the Governor. He had been twice married before his union with Madame de Sévigné's daughter, and it seems likely, considering the fashion of those times, and indeed of French marriages now, the mother was influenced by ambition. She found it did not confer happiness. The Count was extravagant and fond of play, though he seems to have been a kind husband. Still, it's evident that Madame de Sévigné was constrained in her letters to him. She compliments him, professes much affection, and was always on friendly terms with him because he was the husband of her darling daughter, but her letters to him never go beyond this. Letter 1. Paris, Wednesday, the 23rd of June, 1670. You have written me the most charming letter in the world. I should have answered it much sooner had I not known that you were traversing your Provence. I should likewise have sent you the music you desired, but have not yet been able to procure it. In the meantime, let me tell you that I love you most affectionately, and if that is capable of giving you the satisfaction you assure me it does, you ought to be the most contented man in the world. You must certainly be so in the correspondence you carry on with my daughter. It appears to me very animated on her part, and I do not think anyone can love another more than she does you. I hope to return her to you safe and sound, with a little one, the same, or I will burn my books. 
I'm not very skilful indeed myself, but I can ask advice and follow it, and my daughter on her side takes all possible care of herself. Letter to Paris, Wednesday, August the 6th, 1670. Is it not true that I've given you the prettiest wife in the world? And can anyone be more prudent, more regular in her conduct? Can anyone love you more, have more Christian sentiments, long more ardently to be with you, or attend more strictly to the duties of her station? It is ridiculous enough to say all this of my own daughter, but I admire her as other people do, and perhaps more, as I am more an eyewitness of her behaviour. And to own the truth to you, whatever good opinion I had of her as to the principal points, I never thought she would have been so exact as she is in all the minuter ones. I assure you, everybody does her justice and she loses none of the praises which are so much her due. Letter 3, Paris, Friday, August the 15th, 1670. When I write to you so frequently, you must remember that it is on condition that you do not answer me. Relying on this, I shall proceed to tell you that I am heartily rejoiced at the many honours that are conferred on you, it appears to me that the Commandant has less share in them than Monsieur de Grignon himself, and I think I see a partiality for you that another would not experience. I find there is so brisk a correspondence kept up between a certain lady and you that it would be ridiculous to give you any news. I have not so much as a hope of acquainting you that she loves you. Her every action, her whole conduct with all her little anxieties and cares about you, tell it plain enough. I am very delicate in the point of friendship, and pretend to know something about it, and I own to you that I am perfectly satisfied with what I see, and could not wish it to be greater. Enjoy this pleasure to the utmost, and never be ungrateful. If there is any little vacant place in your heart, Allow me the pleasure of occupying it, for I assure you, you hold a very considerable one in mine. Letter 4, Paris, Wednesday, December the 10th, 1670. Madame de Coulanges has told me several times that you love me sincerely, that you talk of me, that you wish me with you. As I made the first advances toward this friendship and loved first, you may judge how happy I am to find that you return the partiality I have so long had for you. All that you write of your daughter is admirable, and I had no doubt that the good health of the mother would comfort you for your disappointment. The joy I should have had in acquainting you with the birth of a son would have been too great. It would have been showering too many blessings at once. And the pleasure I naturally take in being the messenger of good news would have been carried to excess. I shall soon be in the same condition you saw me in last year. Reader's note. In November 1669, when Madame de Sévigné learned that her son-in-law would not be living in Paris and had been named Lieutenant General in Provence, back to main text. I must love you extremely to send my daughter to you at this inclement season of the year. How foolish it is to leave a good mother, with whom you are sure she is very well satisfied, to run after a man at the furthest end of France. I give you my word, nothing can be more indecorous than such behaviour. I do believe you were greatly concerned at the death of the amiable Duchess. I was so afflicted myself that I stood in need of comfort while I was writing to you about it. Readers note Madame la Duchesse de Saint-Simon, first wife of the father of the memoirist, back to main text. My daughter desires me to acquaint you with the marriage of Monsieur de Nevers. Footnote, Philippe Giomancini, Duke of Nevers, back to main text. That Monsieur de Nevers, who was so difficult to be caught, 
who used to slip so unexpectedly through the hands of the fair, is at length going to wed. And whom, think you? Not Mademoiselle de Houdancourt, nor yet Mademoiselle de Grandchier, but the young, the handsome, and the modest, Mademoiselle de Tiange. Footnote Diane Gabrielle de Dama, daughter of Claude Léonor, Marquis de Tiange, and Gabrielle de Rochua Montmar, sister to Madame de Montespan, who was then mistress to Louis the Fourteenth. Back to main text. The modest Mademoiselle de Tiange, who was brought up at the Abbey au Bois. Madame de Montespan has the wedding solemnized at her house next Sunday. She acts as mother on the occasion and receives the honours as such. The king restored Monsieur de Nevers to all his posts, so that this bell, though she does not bring him a penny of fortune, will be worth more to him than the richest heiress in France. And Madame de Montespan does wonders in everything. I forbid you to write to me, write to my daughter, and leave me the freedom of writing to you without embarking you on a train of answers, which would rob me of the pleasure I have in acquainting you with every little trifle. Continue to love me, my dear Count. I dispense with your honouring my motherly dignity, but you must love me, and assure yourself that there is not a place in the world where you are so dearly beloved as you are here. Letter 5, Paris, Friday, January the 16th, 1671. Alas, the poor dear child is still with me, for it was utterly impossible for her to do what she would, to have set out the 10th of this month, as she all along hoped and intended to do. The rains have been and are still so very violent that it would have been downright folly to have attempted it. The rivers are overflowed, the roads are all under water, and the carriage track so covered that she would have run the risk of being overturned in every ford. In short, things are in such a state that Madame de Rochefort, who is at her country seat and is absolutely wild to me in Paris, where she is expected with the greatest impatience by her husband and mother, does not dare to venture till the roads are a little safer. Indeed, the winter is perfectly dreadful. We've not had an hour's frost, but there's been a continual deluge of rain every day. Not a boat can pass under any of the bridges. The archers of the Pont Neuf are, in a manner, choked up. In short, it is something more than common. I own to you that, seeing the season so very inclement, I am warmly opposed to her setting out. I would not stop her for the cold, the dirt, or the fatigues of the journey, but methinks I would not have her drowned. Yet strong as the reasons are for her stay, nothing could have prevailed on her had not the coadjutor, who was to go with her, been engaged to perform the marriage ceremony of his cousin de Arcourt, which is to be solemnised at the Louvre. Footnote Marie Angélique Henriette Lorraine married the 7th of February, 1671, to Nuno Alvarez Pierre de Mello, Duke of Carval in Portugal. Back to main text. Monsieur de Lyon is to stand proxy. The king has spoken to the coadjutor upon this subject, but the affair has been put off day by day and may not be finished this week. My poor daughter is in such extreme impatience to be gone that the time she now passes with us cannot be called living, and if the coadjutor does not disengage himself from this same wedding, I think I see her ready to commit an act of folly by setting out without him. It would be so extraordinary to go by herself, and so happy on the contrary to have a brother-in-law to accompany her, that I shall do all in my power to prevent their separation. In the meantime, the waters may be a little drained off. But I can assure you that I have no sort of pleasure in her company. I know that she must leave us. All that passes now is mere ceremony and preparation. We make no parties, we take no amusement. Our hearts are heavy, 
and we talk of nothing but rains, bad roads, and dreadful stories of persons who have lost their lives in attempting to pass them. Letter 6. The Rocks. Sunday, August the 9th, 1671. You alone, my dear Count, could have prevailed on me to give my daughter to a Provençal. This is truth, as Carus and Merinville will witness for me. For if I had liked the latter as well as you, I should not have found so many expedients to prevent a conclusion, and she had been his. Do not entertain the least doubt of my having the highest opinion of you. A moment's reflection will convince you I am sincere. I am not at all surprised that my daughter does not mention me to you. She served me just the same by you last year. Believe me, therefore, whether she tells you so or not, that I never forget you. I think I hear her scold and say, Ah, this is a pretense of yours to excuse your own laziness. I shall leave you to dispute this among yourselves, and assure you that, though you are perhaps the most happily formed for general love and esteem of any man in the world, yet you never were and never will be more sincerely loved by any one than by me. I wish for you every day in my more, but you are proud. I see that you expect me to visit you first. You may think yourself very happy that I am not an old woman, but am resolved to enjoy the remains of life and health in taking that journey. Our abbe seems to have as strong an inclination to go there as myself, that is one good thing. Adieu, my dear Grignon. Love me always. Treat me with the sight of you, and you shall see my woods. Letter 7, Paris, June the 20th, 1673. Come hither, my son-in-law. So then, you were resolved to send my daughter back to me in the first coach? You were displeased with her and quite angry that she admires your castle and think that she takes too great a liberty in pretending to reside there and command in everything? As you say you hate everything that is worthy of hatred, you certainly must hate her. I enter into all your displeasure. You could not have addressed yourself to one who feels the force of it better than myself. But you know, after what you said, that you make me tremble to hear you talk of wishing me at Grignon, and I'm quite inconsolable for that reason, for there's nothing in futurity so dear to me as the hope of seeing you there, and whatever I may say, I'm persuaded that you will be very glad of it too, and that you love me. It is impossible it should be otherwise. I love you so well that the same sentiments must necessarily pass from me to you and from you to me. I commend the care of my daughter's health to you above all earthly things. Watch over it. Be absolute master in all that regards it. Do not behave as you did at the Bridge of Avignon. Keep your authority in this one point and in everything else. Leave her to her own way. She is more skilful than you. Ah, how I pity you for having lost the pleasure of receiving her letters. You were much happier a year ago. Would to God you had that pleasure now, and I had the mortification of seeing and embracing her. Adieu, my dearest Count. Though I believe you are as much beloved as any man in the world, yet I do not think that any of your mothers-in-law ever loved you so well as I do. Footnote, Madame de Sévigné was the third mother-in-law, back to main text. Letter 8, The Rocks, July 1674 You flatter me too much, my dear Count. I shall accept but one part of your fine speeches, and that is the thanks you return me for having given you a wife that constitutes all your happiness. For indeed, I think I contributed a little toward it, 
but the authority you have acquired over her in Provence has been wholly owing to yourself, to your merit, your birth, and your conduct. All this I have nothing to do with. Ah, how much you lose by my heart not being at ease. Le Camus is delighted with me. He tells me I sing his airs extremely well. He certainly composes divinely, but I am so dull and woebegone that I can learn nothing. You would sing them like an angel. I assure you that Le Camus has a high opinion both of your voice and judgment. I regret the loss of these little accomplishments, which were too apt to neglect. Why should we lose them? I have always said that we ought not to part with them, and that they can never be an encumbrance, but what is to be done with the rope round the neck? You have given my daughter one of the most delightful journeys in the world. She is quite enchanted with it. But then you have dragged her over hills and dales, and exposed her to the dangers of the Alps, and to the uncivil waves of the Mediterranean. In short, I have a month's mind to chide you for it. But let me first embrace you most affectionately. Letter 9, The Rocks, November the 6th, 1675 Count, I am delighted to hear that my daughter is satisfied with you. Allow me to thank you by reason of the great interest I take in your affairs and which I entreat you to preserve. You cannot fail of this without ingratitude and without doing injustice to the blood of the Ademas. I have read in the Crusades of one of these who was an illustrious personage six hundred years ago. He was beloved as you are and would never have given a moment's uneasiness to such a wife as yours. His death was lamented by an army of three hundred thousand men and mourned by all the princes in Christendom. Not many pages after, I find a Castellane, not altogether so ancient. He is indeed a mere modern. It was but 520 years since he made a great figure. I conjure you, therefore, by these two noble ancestors, who are my particular friends, to be guided by Madame de Grignon, and consider how much you will consult your own interest in doing so. End of section 42. Section 43 of the Letters of Madame de Savigny to her daughter and friends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Letters to the President de Mousseau. Footnote. Monsieur de Mousseau was President of the Chamber of Accounts of Montpellier. It appears that Madame de Sévigné, at the time of her journey into Provence, had found him on terms of strict friendship with Monsieur and Madame de Grignon and Monsieur de Vard and Corbinelli, and that she was so sensible of his worth and of the charms of his mind as to enter into a correspondence with him. But we remark with astonishment that no mention is made of this interesting man in any of the preceding letters back to main text from 1681 to 1682 letter one paris friday january the eighth 1681 i should be very sorry sir if our correspondence were to end with the temple of montpellier and all you say to this effect in doing the honours of your letters by supposing the assurance of their continuance to contain a threat to me is so ungenerous that I should be disposed to scold you. Nor would the pretty turn you have given to this guarantee you from my reproaches, were it not that the letter you have written to my son makes me eager to tell you how much it has delighted me. The neatness of the beginning has reminded me of our merry stories and of the beauty of the verses that made me regret that you have not continued them in good earnest. If you have done so, let us share the pleasure of reading them. The two Latin verses you explain are very just, 
In short, we esteem your verse, your prose, and all your productions. My son is still your adorer. My daughter admires and esteems you in the highest degree. I presume you know my own sentiments for you, and that you see plainly there's not a family in the world who so justly appreciates your merit. You do the same in regard to Monsieur de Carcassonne by praising him as you do. The poor Chevalier has been here for these six weeks, laid up with the rheumatism. He receives visits from persons almost as lame as himself. Those who are left-handed show at least that their taste is right. You have returned Monsieur de Noailles to us in a very ill state of health. He has so violent an diarrhoea that it seems as if he had eaten to his own share all that he has expended at Montpellier. In short, he has been obliged to resign the staff the staff that was the object of his love, the staff he went so far to assume, the staff which was the reward of all his other services. It is natural to suppose that he must be very ill when he gives it himself to Monsieur de Luxembourg. You say much in his favour when you speak of the distinction and expansion of heart he showed you, I wish his generosity had gone so far as to have induced him to return a mortified friend's visit. Footnote Anne Jules, Duc de Noailles, had been nominated to the command in Languedoc, of which the Duc de Maine, then too young to take it upon himself, had just been appointed governor. Preparations were making for the destruction of Calvinism. In conjunction with the Intendant Dagsaw, father of the celebrated Chancellor, Noailles endeavoured for a long time to engage the court to employ mild measures, and even in the execution of the most rigorous, he at first showed some humanity, but he afterward became one of the most violent persecutors, and his dispatches, concerted with Louvois, did not fail to excite the king to rigours of which he too late repented. It appears that he thought he could not with propriety in the situation he held return the visit of Monsieur de Vard, then an exile, and whom Madame de Savigny designates by the title of the mortified friend. Back to main text. I wish his generosity had gone so far as to have induced him to return our mortified friend's visit. Have I not heard you say that we ought to respect the unfortunate? It cannot be doubted that this has increased the mortification. I pity him for having suffered this feeling to take possession of him, and to have surmounted even his Christian philosophy. But I pity him still more if your heart be yet closed against him. A friend like you would be a true consolation in all his afflictions. Our friend, Corvinelli, is entirely occupied here with his affairs. He does wonders. He's become the best lawyer in Paris. And this qualification came to him unexpectedly, along with his peruke and Brandenburg, so that we should much sooner have taken him for a captain of cavalry than a man of business. It is thus the exterior often deceives us. If Monsieur de Vard had not thrown him into this employment, his gratitude and inclination would lead him straight to you. His heart is still perfect in all the moral virtues. They will become Christian virtues when it shall please Providence, whom we still adore, and who seems to treat you well by the sentiments it inspires you with. Adieu, my dear sir. We should have many things to say to each other if we met. Who knows that some day or other we may not. Our friend writes to you separately. So much the worse for him. He will not know that I have the pleasure of assuring you here of my sincere and faithful friendship. Letter 2, Paris, April the 17th, 1682 
if you are alarmed at the appearance of my neglect be assured sir it is a false alarm and that appearances are deceitful you do not suffer yourself to be forgotten roche cobiere vivre and the days in which we've seen you are faithful guarantees of what i say and i'm certain you believe it and that being so well informed on every other subject christian humility does not prevent you from knowing your own worth it is the truth therefore you cannot be forgotten our friend and i have said a thousand times let us write to this poor reprobate but by continually delaying it we've embarrassed ourselves by our miserable security it seems to me as if montpellier has given a great deal to the jubilee you know what a horror corbinelli has of this sort of parade which he calls hypocrisy i do not know exactly how he has acted upon the occasion and i have not dared question him but considering the extreme respect he has for this holy mystery and how rigorously he enters into the preparations for it of which he will not abate a single iota i have long been tempted to say to him thus de la meta the half is sufficient for in fact if all the faithful were to follow his ideas upon the subject the ceremonials of religion would be done away this is the inspiration of god and whether it be light or dereliction some great change must happen to alter his opinion monsieur de Vard has put the same question to him that you put to me on his jubilee he has answered very honestly and has given me a probetatem semitipsum homo which may occasion great reflections this is all i can tell you you know and love the soil for indeed the more his heart is known the more it must be admired i perceive his departure approach and i perceive it with sorrow but what may no providence reserve for monsieur de vard monsieur de bussy is recalled after an exile of eighteen years he has seen the king who received him most graciously these are times of justice and clemency we not only do what is well but what is perfectly well i doubt not therefore that this poor exile's term will come and every one else believes it so firmly that if anything can do him injury it is this general report you tell me the most agreeable truth i can hear in assuring me that the young people will bring from Languedoc all the politeness which failed them here would note this refers to the daughter and son-in-law of monsieur de vard monsieur and madame de Rohan, who had spent six months with him at montpellier back to main text they appear to me like the germans who were sent to angers to learn the language they were germans in manners and if they had not learned them out of court would seem to conduct themselves ridiculously it is easy to comprehend that having had so good a master as monsieur de vard for six months they must have profited more than they had done during their whole life letter three paris may twenty sixth sixteen eighty two were you not very much surprised sir to see monsieur de vard slip through your fingers whom you had held so firmly for nineteen years this is the time providence had marked out for him in reality he was no longer thought of he appeared forgotten and sacrificed to example the king who reflects and arranges everything in his head declared one morning that monsieur de vard would be at court in two or three days he said he had written to him by the post that he wished to surprise him and that for more than six months no one had mentioned his name to him his majesty was gratified he wished to create surprise and every one was surprised never did intelligence make so great an impression 
nor so great a noise as this. In short, he arrived on Saturday morning, with a head singular in its kind, and an old justoca à brevet, such as were worn in the year 1663. Footnote, this was a blue greatcoat embroidered with gold and silver, which distinguished the principal courtiers, and a special permission was necessary to wear it. The fashion had passed when Bard returned to court, back to main text. He set one knee to the ground in the king's chamber, Monsieur de Chateauneuf being the only person present. The king told him that while his heart had been wounded, he had not recalled him, but that now he recalled him with a whole heart, and he was glad to see him. Monsieur de Vard made an admirable reply, with an air of being deeply affected, and the gift of tears which God has given him produced no ill effect upon this occasion. After this first interview, the king caused the Dauphin to be called, and presented him to him as a young courtier. Monsieur de Vard recognised and saluted him. The king said to him, laughing, Vard, this is a blunder. You know that no one is saluted in my presence. Monsieur de Vard replied in the same tone, Sire, I have forgotten everything. Your Majesty must pardon me even thirty blunders. Well, I will, said the king, stop at the twenty-ninth. The king afterward laughed at his coat. Monsieur de Vard said, Sire, when a man is so wretched as to be banished from your presence, he is not only unfortunate, but he becomes ridiculous. All this was said in a tone of perfect freedom and playfulness. The courtiers performed wonders. He came one day to Paris and called upon me. I was just gone out to call upon him, but he found my son and daughter at home, and in the evening I found him at his own house. It was a joyful meeting. I mentioned our friend to him. What, madam, my master, my intimate friend, the man in the world to whom I owe the greatest obligations, can you doubt that I love him with my whole heart? This pleased me highly. He resides with his daughter at Versailles. The court goes today, I suppose he will return to catch the king again at Auxerre, for it appears to all his friends that he ought to take this journey, in which he will certainly pay his court well by bestowing the most natural praises on three little things, the troops, the fortifications, and his majesty's conquests. Perhaps our friend will tell you all this, and my letter be only a miserable echo, but at any rate... I have entered into the minutiae because I should like, on such an occasion, to be written to in the same style, and I judge you, my dear sir, by myself. I have often been deceived by others, but never by you. It is said that your worthy and generous friend, Monsieur de Noailles, has rendered very important services to Monsieur de Vard, he is so generous that it is impossible to doubt this. Monsieur de Cavisson has arrived. This must either break off or conclude our marriage. In reality, I am weary of this tedious affair, and I am not in a humour to talk of anything but Monsieur de Vard. Monsieur de Vard forever. He is the gospel of the day. Letter 4 Paris, July the 28th, 1682. You are going to hear a beautiful and an admirable story. Pay great attention to every circumstance attending it. The Prince de Conti, having expressed himself dissatisfied with the Chevalier de Lorraine, because he had said the Prince de la roche sur yon was in love with his wife, found an opportunity of telling him two days ago in the gardens of Versailles that he would do him the honour of fighting him because he had offended him by his conversation, etc. The Chevalier de Lorraine thanked him for the honour he intended him and wished to justify himself in what he had said. 
after which the prince told him that he might have Monsieur de Marsan for his second, who, hearing himself named, stepped forward and accepted the office without hesitation, desiring the prince de Conti to allow Monsieur de Soissons to be the other second, as he had long been an enemy to their family. The proposal was yielded to, the party was formed, the place appointed, the hour chosen, and secrecy enjoined. Can you not fancy yourself in the times of the late Monsieur de Boutevier? Each went his way, but the Chevalier de Lorraine went straight to Monsieur, to whom he related the whole story, and Monsieur, the next moment, confided it to the King. You may guess what he said to his son-in-law. He talked to him for more than two hours, with more of gaiety than anger, but in a tone of authority, which must have caused great repentance. Here the affair ended. The public thinks the Chevalier de Lorraine ought to have refused upon the spot, instead of consenting and then betraying everything, but people of the trade think that a refusal would have excited some angry words from the prince and perhaps some menace not very easy of digestion, and then to have such a stigma cast upon him, and from a man who is so much to be dreaded. In this way his conduct has been approved, and the more so because his courage is unquestionable. What say you to this affair? How does it appear to you to be handled? Alas, if that sainted princess were to descend from heaven and to find her dear son troubled with such impetuosity, do you not think she would retrace her steps from grief and affliction? You will talk this over with Monsieur de Vardes. Would to God that the birth of a Duke of Burgundy, which is hourly expected, could restore it to us. In the section forty three. Section forty four of the letters of Madame de Sevigne to her daughter and friends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Letters to the President de Morceau continued. Letter five. June the 13th, 1684. Word was sent me from Languedoc that I had a lawsuit pending there, that Monsieur de Grignon was prosecuted with rigour and the judges were strange people. I cursed them heartily, sir, and have since found out that you are one of the principals. It is you, therefore, that I have loaded with so many imprecations. You whose protection I have claimed to soften the rigour and to attend to the justice of my cause. It is to Monsieur d'Augouge I am indebted for the information that this odious judge and this highly esteemed Monsieur Mousseau are one and the same. All the anger kindled against the first has disappeared at the name of the second and weapons have fallen from my hand like those of Arcabon when she recognised Amadis. It is to Monsieur de Mousseau that I address this quotation from the opera. You will suppose that in virtue of your title of judge, I shall quote nothing but laws to you. There is one established law in the world, particularly among honest men, which is never to condemn unheard. In this, sir, consists the favour I have to ask you. The Prince de Conti claims an estate of which we have been in possession for three hundred years. I know from Monsieur de Covinelli that three hundred years is a strong title. We request you, sir, to give us time to collect our proofs to convince you of the weakness of the Prince de Conti's claim and of the solidity of ours. Letter 6, Paris, November the 24th, 1685. I have received no letter from you for more than fifteen months. I know not whether our enraged and jealous friend has intercepted any. It is not, however, like him to do so. 
He would be more inclined to assassinate you with the little sword you once used so pleasantly in the garden of Rambouillet. Footnote a jest which refers to Corbinelli. Back to main text. We shall never forget your wisdom nor your folly. And I've spent a year with my son in Brittany, where we've often mentioned you with sentiments with which your merit must impress all hearts that are not unworthy of knowing it. We have been twenty times on the point of writing some nonsense to you. We wish to assure you that the scarcity of the gratification did not prevent you from often being in our remembrance, and twenty times the demon which turns aside good intentions perverted the course of this. At length, sir, after having been overturned, drowned, and had a wound in my leg which has not healed within these six weeks, I left my son and his wife, who was very pretty, and arrived at Bavy at Monsieur de Lamignon's on the 10th or 12th of September, where I found my daughter and all the Grignons. They received me with joy and affection. To complete my happiness, my daughter will not leave me this winter. I have found our dear Corbinelli just as I left him, except a little more philosophical, and dying every day from some cause or other. His freedom excites my envy. In changing his object, he would become a saint. He is, however, so kind and charitable to his neighbour that I really believe the grace of God is concealed under the name of Cartesian. He converts more heretics by his good sense, and by not irritating them by vain disputes, than others by all their controversy. In short, everyone now is a missionary. Everyone thinks he has a mission, and particularly the magistrates and governors of provinces upheld by the dragoons. This is the greatest and most noble action that has ever been conceived or performed. Like us, you have been surprised with other news. What an event is the death of the Prince de Conti. After having experienced all the perils of the Hungarian War, he came here to die of a disorder which he scarcely felt. His lovely widow has deeply bewailed him. She has an annuity of a hundred thousand crowns and has received from the king so many marks of friendship and of his natural affection for her, that with such assistance no one can doubt that she will in time be comforted. Letter 7. Livre, October the 25th, 1686. I received your letter, sir. It presented itself to me as if you wished to make me ashamed of my silence and to believe I have been ill for the purpose of entering into a conversation with me. It reminds me of a very pretty comedy in which the person who wishes to come to an explanation with the lady who enters makes her believe she called him and thus obtains a hearing. If you have the same intention, sir, I return you a thousand thanks. And I really cannot comprehend how esteeming you as I do and remembering you with so much pleasure, speaking of you so readily, having so high a relish for your understanding and your worth, to say no more for fear of exciting jealousy, I can, with so many things to promote a correspondence, have left you seven or eight months without saying a word to you. It is horrible, but what does it signify? Let us remain in this freedom, since it's not compatible with the sentiments I've just expressed for you. I have seen Monsieur La Trousse. We talked of you the moment we had embraced. I think him, by what he told me, highly deserving the esteem you appear to entertain for him. The stroke is at least double. I found him perfectly acquainted with and as sensible of your worth as you can possibly desire must pass through this place on his way to La Trousse. I shall show him your letter, and I do not think it would induce him to change his opinion. You have now Monsieur de Noailles with you. You are in such favour there 
that I shall rejoice with you on the pleasure you will receive at the man whom you have inspired with such lively sentiments of esteem for you. I can easily imagine the confusion which the derangement of the States must have occasioned you, but you cannot dispense with going to Nîmes. I must say a word to you respecting Mademoiselle de Grignon. You know, I presume, that she has been in the convent of the Carmelites for eight months, and that she took the habit in form with a zeal too violent to last. In the first three months she found herself so reduced from the severity of the order, and her stomach so injured by the meagerness of the provision, that she was obliged to eat meat by compulsion. This inability to comply with the rules, even in her novitiate, induced her to quit the convent, but with so true a sentiment of piety, of humiliation at the delicacy of her health, and of such perfect contempt for the world, that the holy nuns have preserved an affection and friendship for her. And she, who has only changed the habit and not the sentiment, has no false shame like those who grow weary of the life, and is now with us, as usual, giving us the same edification. Her residence at Paris is fixed at the Fregantine, where she will board with several others. She will return there at Martinmas when we do. What attaches her to this house is its vicinity to the Carmelites, where she goes daily and whenever a certain princess is there. She takes from this holy convent all that agrees with her, that is, devotion and conversation, and leaves the strictness of the order, to which she was by no means equal. It is thus God has conducted her, and gently repulsed her from the high degree of perfection to which she aspired, to support her in another, a little inferior to it, which cannot but be good, since he gives her grace to love him alone, which is all that can be desired in this world. But Providence has also inspired her with the most noble, just, and praiseworthy thought it was possible to conceive for her family. She was determined that her return to the world should not deprive her father of what she would wished to give him by her civil death, and at quitting her convent, she made him a very handsome present of 40,000 crowns which he owed her, that is, 20,000 crowns principal, and the rest arrears and sums borrowed. This gift has been duly estimated, not only by those who love Monsieur de Grignon, but by those who knew that all her property becoming personal at the age of five and twenty, if she had not disposed of anything by will, would go almost wholly to her father, and that Monsieur de Grignon would have eighty thousand crowns to pay Mademoiselle d'Alarac, reckoning the principal of the jointure at forty thousand. This is enough in conscience for us not to pity the sister, and to rejoice that the family is relieved from this double payment. I own I have been very much affected at this seasonable and generous action, and I admire the goodness of her disposition which led her to do, without affectation, the only thing in the world that could render her dear to her family where she is now received and considered as its benefactress. The understanding alone might have wrought this effect in another, but it is best when produced only by the heart. My daughter has contributed so well to this little manoeuvre that she has received double pleasure from its success. The Chevalier has also done wonders for you may suppose it has been necessary to assist and give a form to these good intentions. In short, all has gone well. Even Mademoiselle Darrach has entered into the justice of the sentiment. I pray that God may reward her by a good establishment, of which he still conceals from us every prospect, so that at present there is no appearance of anything of the kind. 
Do I not weary you, sir, by this long account? You will have an indigestion of the Grignons. To divert you, let us talk a little of poor Sévigné. I should mention him with grief, if I could not tell you that after five months of horrible suffering from medicines which worked him to the very bone, the poor child is at length restored to perfect health. He has spent the whole of August with me in this retreat, which you are now acquainted with. We were alone with the good abbe. We had everlasting conversations, and this long intercourse has renewed our acquaintance with each other, and our acquaintance renewed our friendship. He has returned home with a stock of Christian philosophy, sprinkled with a grain of anchoritism, and particularly with an extreme affection for his wife, by whom he is equally beloved, which makes him altogether the happiest man in the world, because he passes his life agreeably to his own mind. We have talked of you twenty times with friendship and delight, and twenty times we have said, let us write to him. I wish it very much. And when we've been on the point of giving ourselves this pleasure, a demon has stepped in to distract our attention and turn aside our good resolutions. What is to be done, my dear sir, in misfortunes like these? Perhaps you know the mortification of forming good resolutions without the power of executing them. I fear our dear, jealous friend calculates upon spending the winter with you. You will be very glad, you will laugh, and I shall cry. For I have so perfect a confidence in him and so true a friendship for him that I cannot lose the society of such a man without feeling it painfully every moment. Monsieur de Vard, however, whom he is delighted to follow, will restore him to us as he takes him away from us. I am pleased that this attachment continues. You will act your part well, and I consider the pleasure of seeing you and establishing himself again in your heart as a happy circumstance for our friend. Monsieur de Vard has not been sufficiently particular in the information you omitted to tell me. The surest way is to write ourselves, as you see. I do not write to you often, but you will own, when I do, that it is not for nothing. End of section 44section forty five of the letters of madame de savigny to her daughter and friends this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain letters to president de mulso continued letter eight paris november the twenty sixth sixteen eighty six i thought sir that in purchasing an office nothing was necessary but to find money but I see that the manner of giving and receiving it is also to be considered. You will soon be quit of this embarrassment from the desire you always have to contribute to your own tranquillity. Good heavens, how rational and how worthy of you is this disposition, and how just, too, is the choice of your company, when we come to speak and point out its excellence, if we judge from appearances it is very superior to our Parliament's. I can fancy I hear Monsieur Madame de Vernay say a thousand kind things to you and receive yours in return. When this princess mentions me, tell her it is impossible to be more at her service than I am. You have a sister of Madame de la Troche with you who is very amiable. The eldest will place all the attentions you pay her to her own account. I have presented your compliments to the Chevalier de Grignon, who has received them graciously. He pointed out to the Prince, footnote the Prince de Conti. It has been seen in the letter of June the 13th, 1684, that Monsieur de Mousseau was judge in a lawsuit in which Monsieur de Grignon was engaged with this Prince, and that he was moreover attached to him for other reasons, back to main text. 
he pointed out to the prince the silence and discretion of your departure. Nothing can exceed his concern and zeal for your interest. But we can answer for nothing when we are left-handed. What you told me the other day of a certain discourse he held with a certain person makes me exhort you to preserve the noble tranquillity I have always witnessed in you on the success of this affair. We only returned from Livre yesterday. The beauty of the weather and the health of my daughter, which has been nearly established there, made us stay out of gratitude. In the two months we have been there, we have not been able to prevail on our friend to give us his company for more than ten days. He has a thousand little affairs there to which he is accustomed. I know nothing of his intentions with respect to his departure. I almost doubt whether the society he meets at Monsieur de Vard's will not prevent him from setting out soon. I assure you I shall reap the advantage of his inclination to do so with pleasure, but I only contribute toward it by my wishes. Pray inform us how M. de Vard finds himself in the midst of this troop of bohemians. I cannot get this vision out of my eyes. We shall have a thousand things to tell you of the son-in-law. Footnote, M. de Rohan, who had married the daughter of the Count de Vard, back to main text. In short, it struck us the other day that if Homer had been acquainted with him, he would have chosen him, in point of anger, for his Achilles. We have a new prince and a new princess here. Letter 9, Paris, December the 15th, 1686. I wrote to you a long letter, sir, more than a month ago, full of friendship, secrets and confidence. I know not what became of it. It lost its way, perhaps, in seeking for you at the States, since you have not answered it. But this will not prevent me from telling you a melancholy, and at the same time a pleasing piece of intelligence. The death of the Prince, which happened the day before yesterday, the eleventh instant, at a quarter after seven in the evening. And the return of the Prince de Conti to court to the kindness of the prince who asked this favour of the king in his last moments. The king immediately granted it, and the prince had this consolation on his deathbed. But never was joy drowned in so many tears. Reader's note. The prince who died is Louis de Bourbon, Prince de Condé, brother of the Prince de Conti. He was known as the great Condé for his military exploits. He retired to the Chateau of Chantilly. Back to main text. The Prince de Conti is inconsolable at the loss he has sustained. It could not be greater, particularly as he passed the whole time of his disgrace at Chantilly, where he made an admirable use of the understanding and abilities of the Prince, and drew from the fountainhead all that was to be acquired from so great a master, by whom he was tenderly beloved. The prince flew, with a speed that has cost him his life, from Chantilly to Fontainebleau, where Madame de Bourbon was seized with the smallpox, in order to prevent the duke, who had not had this disorder, from nursing her and being with her. Readers note Madame de Bourbon, daughter of Louis Fourteenth, back to main text. For the Duchess, who has always nursed her, would have been sufficient to satisfy him of the care that was taken of her health. He was very ill, and at length died of an oppression with which he was seized, which made him say, as he was on the point of returning to Paris, that he should take a much longer journey. He sent for his confessor, Father Deschamps, and after lying in a state of insensibility for twenty-four hours, and receiving all the sacraments, he died regretted and bitterly lamented by his family and his friends. The king was much afflicted at the event, and ensured the grief of losing so great a man and so great a hero, whose place whole ages will not be able to supply, has been felt by all ranks. 
A singular circumstance happened three weeks ago, a little before the departure of the Prince from Fontainebleau. Vénion, one of his gentlemen, returning from the chase at three o'clock, saw, as he approached the castle, at one of the windows of the armoury, an apparition, that is, a man who had been dead and buried. He dismounted and came nearer. He still saw it. His valet, who was with him, said, I see the same, sir, that you see. Vénéon had been silent that his valet might speak of his own accord. They entered the castle together and desired the keeper to give them the key of the armoury. The keeper went with them. They found all the windows closed and a silence which had been undisturbed for more than six months. This was told to the prince. He appeared struck with it at first, and afterward laughed at it. Everyone heard the story and trembled for the prince. You see what the event has been? Letter 10 Paris, Monday, April the 29th, 1687 Though you like my letters, sir, I am delighted that you do. This is one which will be worth a hundred. My robust health was slightly attacked about a month ago by a little colic, a little rheumatism, a little vexation. Consequently, all this might excuse me from writing to you, but I had rather die than another should tell you that the Prince de Conti is at length returned to court. He is this night at Versailles and the king, like a kind father, has restored him to favour after having exiled him for a while to leave him at leisure to make his own reflections. No doubt he has done so, and the court will be very gay and splendid on the occasion. His Majesty will make several chevaliers at Whitsuntide, but it will be only a family promotion. Monsieur de Chartres, the Duc de Bourbon, the Prince de Conti and Monsieur du Maine, but no one else. All the other candidates must be pleased to have patience. But they will not see without mortification the adjournment of their hopes. The Duc de Vervy is governor to the Duke of Chartres. Madame de Polignac, who is not Mademoiselle d'Alarac, made a visit yesterday to Madame de Grignon. Reader's note. The Vicomte de Polignac, son of one of France's most ancient and prominent families, was contemplating marriage with Mademoiselle d'Alarac, a daughter of Monsieur de Grignon's first wife. The marriage did not take place. The Vicomte's father, Monsieur de Montausier, felt cheated when a, quote, skilful manoeuvre, unquote, by Madame de Grignon diverted half of the sum which was expected to have been part of Mademoiselle d'Alarac's dowry, to the payment of Monsieur de Grignon's debts. Madame de Savigny thought her daughter's action fully justified, but there was a blazing falling out, and Mademoiselle d'Alarac left her father's house to live in the household of Monsieur de Montazier. She married the Marquis de Vibray. Back to main text. Madame de Polignac, who is not Mademoiselle d'Alarac, paid a visit yesterday to Madame de Grignon. She was brilliant, lively, elated with the grandeur of the house of Polignac, fond of talking of the name and all the personages belonging to it. She has taken upon herself the fortune of the two brothers and has supported generously and courageously the frown and disapprobation of the king. She has employed skilful artifices, and instead of deserting the deserted, like women in general, she has made it a point of honour to reinstate them at court. I could answer for it that she will revive and re-establish this family. This is what Providence had in store for them, and which prevented us from being able to read distinctly what it had written for Mademoiselle d'Alarac. Adieu, sir. Love me, for indeed you ought, 
I love your mind, your worth, your wisdom, your folly, your virtue, your humour, your goodness, in short, all that belongs to you, and wish you, and the pretty cubby under your wing, which must afford you so much pleasure and comfort, every possible happiness. All here salute you, except our friend, who knows nothing of this hasty letter. I shall talk of you a great deal with Boralou. Madame Donjot, formerly Bavaria, is very prudent, very amiable, and makes her husband very happy. She might have made him very ridiculous. Letter 11, Wednesday, March the 2nd, 1689. What things, sir, uh, may not be said, but a period in the history of our monarch is the manner in which he has received the King of England. The presence with which he has loaded him in setting out from hence for Ireland, vessels at Brest, where he now is, frigates, troops, officers, the Count d'Avo as ambassador extraordinary and adviser, and who is also to have care of the troops and money. Two millions on his departure, and as much afterward as he wants. Beside these great things, he has given him his arms, his helmet, his cuirass, which cannot fail of bringing good fortune to him. He has given him arms sufficient for ten or twelve thousand men. And as to little conveniences, they are innumerable. Post chaises, admirably made, caleches, carriage and saddle horses, services of gold and silver, toilets and linen camp beds, magnificent swords of state, swords for service, pistols. In short, everything of every kind that can be thought of. And in embracing him, as he bid him adieu, he said to him, You cannot say that I am not affected at your departure. I own to you, however, that I wish never to see you again. But if, unfortunately, you should return, be assured you will find me as you leave me. Nothing could be better said, nothing more just. Generosity, magnificence, magnanimity were never exercised as they have been by His Majesty on this occasion. We hope the Irish war will be a powerful diversion and prevent the Prince of Orange from tormenting us by descents upon our coast. And thus our 300,000 soldiers, our armies, so well stationed everywhere, will only serve to make the King feared without anyone daring to attack him. This is a time of political discussion. I should very much like to hear you talk over these great events. I enclose the opinion of a respectable upholsterer on the questions respecting the furniture of Madame de Mulso. But whatever he may say of a gold fringe and double taffetas of curtains, and though there are many such here, nothing is so pretty, so suitable, or so cool for the summer as curtains made of this beautiful taffety single, and tapestry the same. I've seen them at several houses, and admire them exceedingly. Everything must be looped up and plaited, as he directed. For the other kind of furniture you must have damask or brocade. Letter 12, Grignon, Friday, November the 10th, 1690. Where do you think I am, sir? Did you not know I was in Brittany? Our Corbinelli must have told you so. After having been there sixteen months with my son, I thought it would be very pleasant to spend the winter here with my daughter. This plan of a journey of a 150 leagues at first appeared a castle in the air, but affection rendered it so easy that, in fact, I executed it between the 3rd and 24th of October, on which day I arrived at Robinet's Gate, where I was received by Madame de Grignon with open arms, and with so much joy, affection, and gratitude that I thought I had not come soon enough nor from a sufficiently great distance. 
After this, sir, tell me that friendship is not a fine thing. It makes me often think of you and wish to see you here once more during my life. We shall be here the whole of this winter and the next summer. If you do not find a moment to come and see us, I shall think you have forgotten me. You will not know this house again, it is so much improved, but you will find its owners still abounding with esteem for you. And me, sir, possessing regard for you, capable of driving our friend to madness, and worthy of your paying us this visit. Letter 13, Grignon, June 5th, 1695. I intend, sir, to bring an action against you, and thus I set about it. I wish you to judge it yourself. I have been here more than a year with my daughter, for whom I have as much love as ever. Since that time, you have no doubt heard of the marriage of the Marquis de Grignon to Mademoiselle de Saint-Mont. You have seen her often enough at Montpellier to be acquainted with her person, you have also heard mention of the vast wealth of her father. You were not ignorant that this marriage was solemnised with great pomp in the chateau which you know. I suppose you cannot have forgotten the time when the true esteem we have always preserved for you began. On this subject, I measure your sentiments by my own, and I judge that we, not having forgotten you, you cannot have forgotten us. I even include Monsieur de Grignon, whose date is still more ancient than ours. I collect all these things, and I find myself injured on every side. I complain of it here, I complain of it to our friends, I complain of it to our dear Cobinelli, the jealous, confidant and witness of all the esteem and friendship we bear you. And at length, sir, uh, I complain of it to yourself. Whence proceeds this silence? Is it from forgetfulness? From perfect indifference? I know not which to say. What would you have me think? What does your conduct resemble? Give a name to it, sir. The cause is now ready for your sentence. Pass it. I consent that you should be both party and judge. Grignon, Saturday, February the 4th, 1696. I was right, sir, when I supposed you would be concerned at my anxiety and would use all the diligence in your power to relieve it. Monsieur Barbarac's prescription and your letter had wings, as you wished. And it seems that this little fever which appeared so low had wings too, for... It vanished at the mere mention of Monsieur Barbarac's name. Seriously, sir, there's something miraculous in this sudden change, and I cannot doubt that your wishes and your prayers contributed to produce it. Judge of my gratitude by their effect. My daughter goes halves with me in all I say here. She returns you a thousand thanks and entreats you to give a great many to Monsieur Babarak. We are happy in having no longer anything to do but to take patience and rhubarb, which she finds agree well with her. We doubt not that in this quiet state rhubarb is a medicine which Monsieur Babarak must approve, with a regimen which is sometimes better than all. Thank God, sir, both for yourself and for us. For we are certain that you are interested in this acknowledgement, and then, sir, cast your eyes upon all the inhabitants of the chateau and judge of their sentiments for you. End of section 45. Section 46 of the letters of Madame de Savigny to her daughter and friends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Letters to Monsieur de Coulanges. Footnote Philippe Emmanuel de Coulanges, 
master of the requests, so well known for his wit, humour, and the singular talent he had for a jovial song. He was first cousin to Madame de Sévigné, back to main text. From 1670 to 1696. Letter 1. Paris, Monday, December the 15th, 1670. I'm going to tell you a thing, the most astonishing, the most surprising, the most marvellous, the most miraculous, the most magnificent, the most confounding, the most unheard of, the most singular, the most extraordinary, the most incredible, the most unforeseen, the greatest, the least, the rarest, the most common, the most public, the most private till today, the most brilliant, the most enviable. In short, a thing of which there is but one example in past ages, and that not an exact one either. A thing that we cannot believe at Paris. How then will it gain credit at Lyon? A thing which makes everybody cry, Lord have mercy upon us. A thing which causes the greatest joy to Madame de Rohan and Madame d'Autrive. Reader's note, joy from seeing a royal lady marrying below her rank as they had done. Back to main text. A thing in fine, which is to happen on Sunday next, when those who are present will doubt the evidence of their senses. A thing which, though it is to be done on Sunday, yet perhaps will not be finished on Monday. I cannot bring myself to tell it to you. Guess what it is. I give you three times to do it in. What? Not a word to throw at a dog? Well then, I find I must tell you. Monsieur de Lausanne is to be married next Sunday at the Louvre. Footnote Antonius Nompai de Comment, Marquis de Puyguiem, afterward Duc de Lausanne. Back to main text. To pray guess to whom? I give you four times to do it in. I give you six. I give you a hundred. Says Madame de Coulanges, it's really very hard to guess. Perhaps it is Madame de la Valliere. Indeed, madame, it is not. It is Mademoiselle de Retz, then. No, nor she neither. You are extremely provincial. Lord bless me, say you, what stupid wretches we are. It is Mademoiselle de Colbert all the while. Nay, no, now you are still further from the mark. And then it must certainly be Mademoiselle de Coiqui. You have it not yet. Well, I find I must tell you at last. He is to be married next Sunday at the Louvre, with the King's leave, to Mademoiselle, Mademoiselle de... Mademoiselle de... Guess. Pray, guess her name. He is to be married to Mademoiselle... The great Mademoiselle. Mademoiselle, daughter to the late Monsieur. Footnote, Gaston of France, Duke of Orléans, brother to Louis the Thirteenth. back to main text. Mademoiselle, granddaughter of Henry the Fourth. Mademoiselle Du, Mademoiselle de Dombe, Mademoiselle de Montpensier, Mademoiselle d'Oléon, Mademoiselle, the king's cousin German. Mademoiselle, destined to the throne. Mademoiselle, the only match in France that was worthy of Monsieur. What glorious matter for talk. If you should burst forth like a bedlamite, say we have told you a lie, that it is false, that we are making a jest of you, and a pretty jest it is, without wit or invention. In short, if you abuse us, we shall think you quite in the right. For we have done just the same things ourselves. Farewell. You will find by the letters you receive by this post, whether we tell you truth or not. Letter 2, Paris, Friday, December the 19th, 1670. What is called falling from the clouds happened last night at the Tuileries, but I must go further back. 
You have already shared in the joy, the transport, the ecstasies of the princess and her happy lover. It was just as I told you. The affair was made public on Monday. Tuesday was passed in talking, astonishment and compliments. Wednesday, Mademoiselle made a deed of gift to Monsieur de Lausanne, investing him with certain titles, names and dignities necessary to be inserted in the marriage contract which was drawn up that day. She gave him then, till she could give him nothing better, four duchies. The first was that of Count Du, which entitles him to rank as first peer of France, the Dukedom of Montpensier, which title he bore all that day, the Dukedom de saint fajo and the Dukedom of Châteauroux, the whole valued at twenty-two millions of livres. The contract was then drawn up, and he took the name of Montpensier. Thursday morning, which was yesterday, Mademoiselle was in expectation of the king signing the contract, as he'd said he'd do, but about seven o'clock in the evening the queen, monsieur, and several old dotards that were about him had so persuaded his majesty that his reputation would suffer in this affair that, sending for Mademoiselle and monsieur de Lausanne, he announced to them, before the prince, that he forbade them to think any further of this marriage. Reader's note. Objections not only from several old dotards, but most effectively from Lausanne's enemy, Madame de Montespan, who desired Mademoiselle's vast inheritance for her children. For his outbursts against Madame de Montespan, Lausanne was imprisoned in the fortress of Pignerol in Italy for ten years, when he finally consented to renounce the lands granted to him by Mademoiselle. Back to main text. Monsieur de Lausanne received the prohibition with all the respect, submission, firmness, and at the same time despair that could be expected in so great a reverse of fortune. As for Mademoiselle, she gave a loose to her feelings and burst into tears, cries, lamentations, and the most violent expressions of grief. She keeps her bed all day long and takes nothing within her lips but a little broth. What a fine dream is here! What a glorious subject for a tragedy or romance, but especially talking and reasoning eternally. This is what we do, day and night, morning and evening, without end and without intermission. We hope you will do the same. E fra tanto vi bacio le mani. And with this, I kiss your hand. Letter 3, Paris, Wednesday, December the 24th, 1670. You are now perfectly acquainted with the romantic story of Mademoiselle and Monsieur de Lausanne. It is a story well adapted for a tragedy and in all the rules of the theatre. We laid out the acts and scenes the other day. We took four days instead of four and twenty hours, and the piece was complete. Never was such a change seen in so short a time. Never was there known so general an emotion. You certainly never received so extraordinary a piece of intelligence before. Monsieur de Losa behaved admirably. He supported his misfortune with such courage and intrepidity, and at the same time showed so deep a sorrow, mixed with such profound respect, that he's gained the admiration of everybody. His loss is doubtless great, but then the king's favour which he has by this means preserved, is likewise great, so that upon the whole his condition does not seem so very deplorable. Mademoiselle, too, has behaved extremely well on her side. She has wept much and bitterly, but yesterday for the first time she returned to pay her duty at the Louvre, after having received the visits of everyone there, so the affair is all over. Adieu. Letter 4, Paris, Wednesday, December the 31st, 1670. I have received your answers to my letters. I can easily conceive the astonishment you were in at what passed between the 15th and 20th of this month. The subject called for it all. I admire likewise your penetration and judgment, 
in imagining so great a machine could never support itself from Monday to Sunday. Modesty prevents my launching out in your praise on this head, because I said and thought exactly as you did. I told my daughter on Monday, This will never go on as it should till Sunday. I will wager, notwithstanding this wedding seems to be sure, that it will never come to a conclusion. In effect, the sky was overcast on Thursday morning, and about ten o'clock, as I told you, the cloud burst. That very day I went about nine in the morning to pay my respects to Mademoiselle, having been informed that she was to go out of town to be married, and that the coadjutor of Rheims was to perform the ceremony. Footnote, Charles Maurice de Tellier, back to main text. These were the resolves on Wednesday night, but matters have been determined otherwise at the Louvre ever since Tuesday. Mamselle was writing. She made me place myself on my knees at her bedside. She told me to whom she was writing, and upon what subject, and also of the fine presents she had made the night before, and the titles she had conferred. And as there was no match in any of the courts of Europe for her, she was resolved, she said, to provide for herself. She related to me word for word a conversation she'd had with the king, and appeared overcome with joy to think how happy she should make a man of merit. She mentioned with a great deal of tenderness the worth and gratitude of Monsieur de Lausanne. To all which I made her this answer. Upon my word, mademoiselle, your highness seems quite happy, but why was not this affair finished at once last Monday? Do you not perceive that the delay will give time and opportunity to the whole kingdom to talk? and that it is absolutely tempting God and the King to protract an affair of so extraordinary a nature as this to so distant a period. She allowed me to be in the right, but was so sure of success that what I said made little or no impression on her at the time. She repeated the many amiable qualities of Monsieur de Lausanne and the noble house he was descended from, to which I replied in these lines of Cornet's Polyuctus. Du moins, on ne la peut blâmer de mauvais choix, Polyucte a du nom et sort du son des rois. Her choice of him, no one can surely blame, who springs from kings and boasts a noble name. Reader's note, it was a conceit of the House of Comor that they were descended from the kings of Scotland, back to main text, upon which she embraced me tenderly. Our conversation lasted above an hour. It is impossible to repeat all that passed between us, but I may without vanity say that my company was agreeable to her, for her heart was so full that she was glad of any one to unburden it to. At ten o'clock she devoted her time to the nobility, who crowded to pay their compliments to her. She waited all the morning for news from court, but none came. All the afternoon she amused herself with putting Monsieur de Montpensier's apartment in order, which she did with her own hands. You know what happened at night. The next morning, which was Friday, I waited upon her and found her in bed. Her grief redoubled at seeing me. She called me to her, embraced me, and whelmed me with tears. Ah, said she, you remember what you said to me yesterday? What foresight, what cruel foresight. In short, she made me weep to see her weep so violently. I have seen her twice since. She still continues in great affliction, but behaves to me as to a person that sympathises with her in her distress, in which she is not mistaken, for I really feel sentiments for her that are seldom felt for persons of such superior rank. This, however, is between us two and Madame de Coulanges, for you are sensible that this chit-chat would appear ridiculous to others. Letter 5. The Rocks January the 8th, 1690 what a melancholy date my amiable cousin compared with yours. It suits a recluse like me, and that of Rome suits one 
whose fate it is to wander uncontrolled, and, quote, who stalks his idleness from one end of the world to the other, unquote. What a happy life. And how mildly has fortune treated you, as you say, notwithstanding her quarrel with you, always beloved, always esteemed, always carrying joy and pleasure along with you, always the favourite of and fascinated with some friend of consequence, a duke, a prince, or a pope, for I'll add the Holy Father by way of novelty, always in good health, never at the charge of anyone, no business, no ambition, but above all, the advantage of not growing old. This is the height of felicity. You doubt sometimes whether you are not advancing by certain calculations of time and years, but old age is still at a distance. You do not approach it with horror as some persons I could name. This is reserved for your neighbour, and you have not even the fears that are usually felt at seeing a fire in your neighbourhood. In short, after mature reflection, I pronounce you the happiest man in the world. This last journey to Rome is, in my opinion, the most delightful adventure that could have happened to you, with an adorable ambassador, the Duke de Chon, on a noble and grand occasion, and a visit to the beautiful mistress of the world, whom, having once seen, we are always longing to see again. I very much like the verses you have made on her. She cannot be too highly celebrated. I'm sure my daughter will approve them. They are well written and poetical. We sing them. I'm delighted with what you tell me of Paulina, whom you saw at Grignon in your way. I have judged most favourably of her from your praises and the unaffected letter you wrote to Madame de Chaune, which you sent to me. How much I should like to take a journey to Rome as you propose. But then it must be with the face and air I had many years ago, and not with those I now have. A woman, particularly, should not move her old bones except to be ambassadress. I believe that Madame de Coulange, though still young, is of the same opinion. But in my youth I should have been in raptures with such an adventure. It is not the same with you. Everything becomes you. Enjoy then your privilege and the jealousy you excite to know who shall be favoured with you. I will not waste my time in arguing with you on the present state of affairs. All the Duke's prosperities have given no real joy. You fear precisely what all his friends apprehend, that being the only one who can fill the place he holds with equal success and reputation, he will be kept in it too long. The apartment in your new palace creates new alarms, but let us do better. Let us not anticipate evils. Rather, let us hope that everything will happen as we wish, and that we shall all meet again at Paris. I was delighted with your remembrance, your letter and your songs. Write to me whenever it is agreeable and convenient. I take the liberty of sending this by the ambassadress. And I do more, my dear cousin, for under her protection I take the liberty of embracing my dear Governor of Brittany and His Excellency the Ambassador with real affection, and without offence to respect. These high dignities do not intimidate me. I am sure he still loves me. God bless him, and bring him back again. These are my wishes for the new year. Adieu, my dear cousin, I embrace you. Continue to love me, I wish it. It is my whim, and to love you more than you love me. But you are very amiable, and I must not place myself on a par with you. End of section 46「Section 47 of the Letters of Madame de Sévigné to her daughter and friends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Letter 6. Grignan, April 10, 1691. We received a letter dated the 31st of March from our dear Ambassador. 
It came in less than a week. This expedition is delightful, but what he tells us is still more so. It's impossible to write in better spirits. My daughter takes it upon herself to answer him, and, as I desire her, to send the Holy Ghost with all diligence, not only to create a Pope, but to put a speedy termination to business, that he may be able to pay us a visit. She assures me that you will send him word of the conquest of Nice in five days after opening the trenches, by Monsieur de Catenay, and that this intelligence will produce the same effect for our bulls. Footnote, Alexander the Eighth, having dead for two months and a few days. Before he died, he distributed among his nephews all the money he possessed, which made Pasquin say that it would have been better for the church to have been his niece than his daughter. Back to main text. Tell us, my dear cousin, if we judge rightly. We have received Monsieur de Nevers' epistle to the little Leclerc of the Academy. It is accompanied by one of your letters. They always give us great pleasure. The packet came very slowly, we know not why. There's neither rhyme nor reason in the conduct of the post. We think the epistle of Monsieur de Nevers very pretty and very entertaining. In short, all his productions have so peculiar and so excellent a character that after them we can relish no others. The two last verses of the song he made for you charm my daughter as a Cartesian. Speaking of the fine wines of Italy, he says, Sur la membrane de l'essence font des sillons charmants. Footnote. They make charming furrows upon the membranes of the senses. Back to main text. In short, it all deserves praise. For instance, can anything be more humorous in his epistle than the smallest human string wound up to the highest pitch? and the other extreme, of a hundred crotchets rolling in base to the very depth of the abyss. This picture is complete, and the opera of which he speaks is deservedly ridiculed. But we cannot comprehend why he's given his son's name to this epistle. Cui bono? And where is the wit of it? For the style resembles his own as much as one drop of water resembles another. It would be impossible to be deceived, and the subject can give offence to none. If you do not explain this to us, we shall be ill. But let us talk of your grief at having lost this delightful family. Footnote Monsieur and Madame de Nevers, back to main text, which has so well celebrated your merit in verse and prose, while you at the same time was so much alive to the charms of its society. It is easy to conceive the painfulness of this separation. Monsieur de Chon will not suffer us to believe that he shares it with you. An ambassador must be occupied only with the business of the king, his master, who on his side has taken Mons with a hundred thousand men, in a manner truly heroic, going everywhere, visiting every place, and indeed exposing himself too much. The policy of the Prince of Orange, who was taking his measures very quietly with the Confederate princes for the beginning of May, has found itself a little disconcerted by this promptitude. He threatens to come to the assistance of this great place. A prisoner told this to the king, who replied coolly, We came here to wait for him. I defy your imagination to frame a more perfect and more precise answer. I therefore suppose, my dear cousin, that by sending you the news of this other conquest, footnote, the town of Mons surrendered to the king on the 10th of April, the day on which this letter is dated, after a siege of 18 days. To Boileau is attributed the following impromptu, addressed to a lady who required him to write some verses upon the occasion. Mons était disait on qu'on regardait avec grand soin. Louis le Grand en eut besoin. Mon se rendit. Vous sauriez fait comme elle. Mons was a virgin, it is said, kept by a king with greatest care. Louis the Great wished for the maid. 
Mon surrendered. So would you, my fair, back to main text. By sending you news of this other conquest in four days, your Rome will not be sorry to live paternally with her elder son. God knows whether our ambassador will ably support the identity of the greatest king in the world, as Monsieur de Nevers said. Let us return to our own country. Our little Marquis de Grignon went to the siege of Nice like an adventurer, vague di fama, eager for fame. Monsieur de Catinet gave him the command of the cavalry for several days that he might not be a volunteer. This did not prevent him from going everywhere, from exposing himself to the fire, which is at first very brisk, or from bearing fascines, for this is the fashion. But what sort of fascines, my dear cousin? All from orange trees, laurels and pomegranates. They feared nothing but too great a profusion of perfumes. Never was there so beautiful or so delightful a country scene. You can conceive what it must be from your knowledge of Italy. This is the country Monsieur de Savoie has taken pleasure in losing and destroying. Can we call this good policy? We expect the little colonel, the Marquis de Grignon, who is preparing to set out for Piedmont. For this expedition to Nice is only throwing the bait in expectation of the game. He will not be here when you pass, but do you know who will find you here? My son, who is coming to spend the summer with us, and to meet his governor by following the footsteps of his mother. And by speaking of mother and son, do you know, my dear cousin, that I have been for these ten days or more in a sorrow of heart? You alone have had the power of relieving me while I have been employed in writing to you. This has been occasioned by the illness of the dowager Madame de Lavardin, my most intimate and oldest friend. This woman of such excellent and sound understanding, this illustrious widow who gathered us all under her wing, this person of such exalted merit, has fallen suddenly into a sort of apoplexy. She is drowsy, paralytic and feverish. When she is roused, she talks rationally, but she soon relapses. In short, my child, my friendship could not sustain a greater loss. I should feel it keenly. The Duchess de Chon writes to me respecting her and is very much grieved at her illness. Madame de Lafayette still more so. Indeed, her merit is so well known that everyone is interested as in a public loss. Judge then what her friends must feel. I am informed that Monsieur de Lavardin is very much affected. I hope it is true. It is an honour to him to grieve for a mother to whom he is in a manner indebted for whatever he is. Adieu, my dear cousin, my heart is full, I can write no more. If I had begun with this melancholy subject, I should not have had the courage to chat with you as I have done. I will say no more respecting the temple. I have given my opinion of it already. But I shall never like or approve it. Not so with regard to you, for I love you, and shall love and approve of you always. Letter 7, Grignan, July the 24th, 1691 Short reckonings make long friends. I have received all your letters, my dear neighbour, that of May the 20th, that of June the 4th, about which you were uneasy, and the last of July the 4th, with the epistle Monsieur de Nevers sent you from Genoa, and in short all the works of this duke, who is the true son of Apollo and the Muses. You ask me if I do not treasure all his productions. Indeed I do. I have not lost a single one. They have highly amused us, as well as everyone who has passed this way, whom we have deemed worthy of them. The last epistle is rather above Paulina's capacity, 
but we've had the pleasure of finding ourselves capable of explaining to her what she did not understand. With respect to the description of the dinner, it is suited to the taste of the best guests. It made Monsieur de Grignons, the Chevalier de Saint-André, my sons, and all our mouths water. I never saw so excellent a repast. I've just placed it among the other wonders of this duke. To conclude the article of letters, when you have received that of the 25th of June and this, you will have received all. Let us now come to yours, the beginning of which had nearly brought me to tears. How can I fancy you confined to your bed, afflicted in every limb and every joint of your poor little body, and your nerves so affected that you can neither stir hand nor foot? This is enough to drive us to despair. But to see that all this produces a song upon your melancholy situation, accompanied by another, the most humorous in the world, on a thing which you see daily, you may suppose, my poor cousin, this is a real comfort to our hearts, as it proves that the vital principle is not attacked. This fit of the gout has only given you the blue devils, and made you look forward to futurity, under the most melancholy aspect in which it can present itself to you. But this situation, so violent and so contrary to your disposition, has not had leisure to make any impression on you. In spite of St. Peter, which is past, and of the predictions of the physicians, a pope is made, and the cardinals will leave the conclave without the event having cost them their lives. On the contrary, they will recover their health and their liberty. It is not the first time that gentlemen of the faculty have erred in judgment. The Duke de Chan has written us a letter by the courier dated the 15th, which brings news of the exaltation. He thinks of nothing now but of coming to see us. He'll be with us in a fortnight. And though the Pope be a Neapolitan, footnote, Cardinal Pignatelli was elected Pope on the 12th of July and took the name of Innocent the Twelfth. back to main text. He maintains that the affair of the bulls is so well disposed of that it will be a signal gun for saddling horses and setting out for Grignon. This hope gives us great pleasure and very much abridges the share I wish to take in your melancholy calendars. It is at an end, however, my dear cousin. You are cured. You are set out. You are on the point of arriving here. I embrace you a thousand times. Let us talk a little of the table in the ambassador's closet, of the chaos of letters, of the deep abyss of bags, of the confusion of papers from which, like the infernal regions, when once a poor letter is thrown into it, it never comes out again. It was a miracle indeed that mine was found, but it was my daughter's letter in which I had written. She has a great inclination to be offended at being thus lost and confounded with the rest, but I appeased her in the best way I could by assuring her that the ambassador read what she wrote to him with the deepest attention and that it was upon my lines that he had not condescended to throw a single glance and it is the fact, for he said I had not written to him. She replied, but as it was my letter, why consign it to this chaos? To this I knew not what to answer. The ambassador will think of it, if he pleases. It is true that my poor letters have only the value you give them by reading them as you do, for they have their tones and are unbearable when they're brayed out or spelled word by word. Be this as it may, my dear cousin, you give them a thousand times more honour than they deserve. Letter 8, Grinna, July the 26th, 1691. I am so astonished at the news of the sudden death of Monsieur Louvois 
that I know not where to begin the subject to you. Putting it, the death of Blufoy, it is well known, has been the subject of many discussions. It has been said that he was poisoned. Saint-Simon affirms it, and his account charges the king with this crime. Voltaire says with reason that this is repugnant to every idea that has been formed of the character of Louis the Fourteenth. Of those who felt like him, some said that it was a revenge of the Duke of Savoy's, others that Louvois poisoned himself. This last opinion deserves to be inquired into. It is agreed on all sides that he was on the eve of disgrace, that he expected harsh treatment, and that he spoke of death as preferable to this fall, and that he was a violent and passionate man whom no scruple restrained. Under all these circumstances, there's nothing very improbable in his suicide, but it appears that this fact was never cleared up, and it is an inconvenience to which we are easily resigned. It is certain, however, that the king made no concealment that the event of his death happened very opportunely to draw him out of difficulties. It is also certain that the death of this man who had done so much harm was a great loss. The epitaph of Louvois, which appeared at that time, gave a good idea of the public opinion respecting him. Ici J, sous qui tout plié, et qui de tout avait connaissance parfaite, Louvois que personne n'aimait et que tout le monde regrette. Here lies one to whom all yielded, and who knew of all the bent, Louvois whose sense with power wielded, whom no one loved and all lament. Back to main text. I know not how or where to begin the subject to. This great minister then, this man of consequence, who held so exalted a situation, whose le moi, the first person pronoun, as Monsieur Nicole says, was so extensive, who was the centre of so many things, is dead. How many affairs, designs, projects, secrets, interests to unravel, wars begun, intrigues, and noble moves at chess had he not to make and to conduct? God, grant me a little time. I want to give check to the Duke of Savoy, checkmate to the Prince of Orange. No, no, not a moment, a single moment. Can we reason upon this strange event? Indeed we cannot. It is in our closet we must reflect upon it. This is the second minister, footnote, with Monsieur de Seignelay, fact main text. You have seen expire since you've been at Rome. Nothing is more different than the manner of their death, but nothing more similar than their fortunes and the hundred thousand chains which attached them both to the world. With regard to the great objects which ought to lead you to God, you say you find your religious sentiment shaken by what is passing at Rome and in the conclave. My poor cousin, you are deceived. I have heard that a man of very excellent understanding drew a quite contrary inference from what he saw in that great city, he concluded that the Christian religion must necessarily be all holy and all miraculous to subsist thus of itself in the midst of so many disorders and so much profanation. Do then as he did, draw the same inferences, and believe that this very city was formerly washed with the blood of an infinite number of martyrs, that in the first centuries all the intrigues of the conclave ended in choosing from among the priests him who appeared to have the greatest zeal and strength to endure martyrdom. That there were thirty-seven popes who suffered one after the other, and that the certainty of their fate had no influence over them to make them fly from or refuse a situation to which death was attached, and a death of the most horrible nature. You have only to read this history to be convinced that a religion subsisting by a continual miracle 
both in its establishment and its duration, cannot be an invention of men. Men do not think thus. Read St. Augustine in his Verité de la Religion, Truth of Religion. Read Abadi, footnote, author of a book on the truth of the Christian religion. He was a Protestant, back to main text. Very different indeed from that great saint, but not unworthy of being compared with him. Many speaks of the Christian religion. Ask the Abbe de Polignac what he thinks of this book. Collect all these ideas and do not judge so hastily. Believe that whatever intrigues may take place in the conclave, it is the Holy Ghost that always makes the Pope. God works all. He is the sovereign of all. And this is what we ought to think. With this sentiment in a good book, quote, What evil can happen to a man who knows that God does all things and who loves whatever God does? And with this, my dear cousin, I take my leave. End of section 47《Section 48 of the Letters of Madame de Sévigné to her daughter and friends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Letter 9, Grignon, August 14th, 1691. Come hither that I may embrace you, caress you, and tell you that my daughter, whose approbation you so highly value, is delighted with your two little couplets on the Holy Father. Nothing, in my opinion, could be better imagined or better executed. We've all been in raptures. But, my dear cousin, the Duc de Chon, in his letter of July the 20th, says not a word respecting Monsieur de Louvre. His death seems to me to demand an exclamation or two. Footnote, Monsieur de Louvre died on the 16th of July, and it is not surprising that the news of this event should not have reached Monsieur de Chon on the 20th, back to main text. His hopes are very sanguine as to the new Pope, though not the work of his hands. All our interest is that he will give us our bulls, and that you will come and pay us a visit. That day seems to me to be at our fingers' end, so swiftly does time pass. You will find my son at Marseille, who will be there to meet you. This is an attention he owes to our governor by way of amends for not having gone to Rome. I long to know what you thought of the return of Monsieur de Pompon to the ministry. It was to us a subject of real joy. Monsieur and Madame de Guignon had no doubt of this event from a truly prophetic spirit, but I wished it too much even to listen to them. And when Madame de Vannes sent the news to my daughter, I was so surprised and so transported that I knew not what I heard. At length I comprehended that it was a very agreeable truth, not only to me but to the rest of the world, for you cannot form an idea how generally his return is approved. I have paid my compliments to Madame de Chon and our ambassador on the choice of Monsieur de Beauvilliers. This is another strange man with whom the king augments his counsel, which is now perfect, like everything his majesty does. He is the cleverest man in his kingdom. He is never idle and provides for everything. Nothing remains but to pray to God that he may be preserved to us. The Dauphin enters into all the councils. Do you not also approve of this? It is truly associating him with the empire. We have subjects for admiration everywhere. If your good Pope would make peace, it would be an act worthy of himself, and it would place us in a situation to praise, with a more tranquil mind, all the wonders we see. Adieu, my dear cousin. You know how I am disposed toward you. Monsieur de Barillon and Monsieur de Jeannin are dead. 
we shall die too. Letter 10. Paris. Sick. Reader's Note. Grignon. February the 3rd, 1695. Madame de Chon sends me word that I am fortunate in being here in the sunshine. She thinks all our days are woven with silk and gold. Alas, my dear cousin, it is a hundred times colder here than at Paris. We are exposed to every wind. It is the south wind, the northeast wind. It is the devil. It is who shall insult us. They fight among themselves, which shall have the honour of confining us to our apartments. All our rivers are taken. The Rhone, the furious Rhone, cannot resist them. Our writing desks are frozen. Our benumbed fingers can no longer guide our pens. We breathe nothing but snow. Our mountains are charming in their excess of horror. I wish every day for a painter who could take a good representation of these frightful beauties. Such is our situation. Relate it to our good Duchess de Chon, who fancies us to be in meadows with parasols, walking under the shadow of orange trees. You formed an excellent idea of the rural magnificence of our wedding. Footnote the marriage of the Marquis de Grignon, Louis Provence, son of Madame de Grignon and Monsieur de Grignon, back to main text. Everyone has shared in the praises you bestow, but we know not what you mean by the wedding night. Alas, how coarse you are. I was charmed with the manner and modesty of the evening. I informed Madame de Coulanges so. The bride was conducted to her apartment. Her toilet, her linen, her night clothes were brought. She took off her head ornaments, was undressed and went to bed. We knew nothing of who came in or went out of her room. Everyone retired to his own apartment. We arose the next morning without going to the bride folks. They also arose, dressed themselves. No foolish questions were asked them. Are you my son-in-law? Are you my daughter-in-law? They are what they are. No gay breakfast was prepared. Everyone ate and did as he pleased. Everything was conducted in silence and with modesty. There were no uncomfortable looks, no confusion, no improper jests. This is what I had never seen before, and what struck me as being the most becoming and the pleasantest thing in the world. The cold freezes me and makes my pen fall from my hands. Where are you? At St. Martin's, at Meudon, or at Bavy? What happy spot contains the youthful and amiable Coulanges? I have just been railing against avarice to Madame de Coulanges. It gives me great joy from the riches Madame de Mecklenburg has left to think I shall die without any ready money, but at the same time without debts. This is all I ask of God and is enough for a Christian. Letter 11, Grignon, May 28th, 1695. I've received your two letters from Sean, my dear cousin. We found some verses in them that delighted us. We've sung them with extreme pleasure. And more than one person will tell you so, for you must not be ignorant of the good taste we preserve here for everything you do. With respect to the gaiety and charms of your mind, you certainly advance and go back with respect to your register. This is all that can be wished. It is what naturally lays the foundation of the desire everyone has for your society. To whom are you not welcome? With whom do you not accommodate yourself? And then which is best of all, your conduct in not obtruding yourself and in allowing room to the wish of seeing you, and give us the true relish to your vanity. The proverb must be forcible indeed, if it be true, that you are not a prophet in your own country. I often receive news from Madame de Coulanges, 
Her correspondence is very entertaining, and her health thought no longer to create alarm, especially having the resource which we must have that when she is tired of medicine and unperceived with respect to it, the most salutary remedy will be to take no more. But to return to Schoen, I know its beauty and can discern from hence how dull our good governor is there. It is in vain for you to give the best reasons in the world. He will constantly answer, I do not know, and if you go on, he will silence you by saying, I shall die. This is what will happen, no doubt, till he has acquired a taste for repose and for the charms of a quiet life. Habits are too strong, and the agitation attached to command and to high station has made too deep an impression to be easily effaced. I wrote this to the Duke upon the deputation of my son, and I jested with him, saying things I did not believe respecting his solitude at Schoen. I treated him like a true hermit, holding conversations with the beautiful fountain called the Solitary. I suppose his repast suited to his situation, and that dates and wild fruits would compose all his banquets. I pitied his house steward, and in saying all these trifles I found that I stood in great need of you, and that the brain I know him to possess. Good note, Monsieur de Schoen read as ill, as Monsieur de Coulange read well, back to main text, that the brain I know him to possess would make strange work with my poor letter. You came to my assistance, as I supposed you would, and you are now in another country, where you feel all the delight of paternal love. What say you? You could not have believed it to be so strong if you had not experienced it. It would have been a great pity if all the good instructions you have given to little children had not been followed by some child of your imagination. The little Count de Nietzsche is a masterpiece. Footnote, the whole of this pleasantry is explained in some songs of Monsieur de Collange to Madame de Louvois, and turns upon a story which had come to them from Provence. Back to main text. And the singularity of being invisible makes him superior to the rest. You make so good a use of this story that I scarcely dare recall you. You have immortalized it. Nothing can be prettier than these couplets. We sing them with pleasure. We've had a delightful introduction of spring, but for two days past, the rain, which we do not like here, has been as violent as in Brittany and Paris, so that we have been accused of having brought it into fashion. It interrupts our walks, but it does not silence our nightingales. In short, my dear cousin, our days pass too quickly. We dispense with great bustle and with the great world. Our society, however, would not displease you. And if ever a puff of wind shall blow you to this royal chateau, but this is a chimera, and we must hope to see you again elsewhere, in a more natural and probable situation. We have yet a summer before us for writing to each other. Letter 12, Grignon, August the 6th, 1695. I shall write you only a very short and poor letter, my dear friend, to thank you for yours, which has given us great pleasure. I shall never change my opinion with respect to long and circumstantial details while I read yours. We are charmed with Navarre, footnote. A chateau near Evreux, which belonged to the Duke de Bouillon, back to main text, the situation, the building, like that of Marley, which I've never seen, the excellent society, all this convinces me that the house ought to rank with yours. As for Choisy, it is made on purpose for you. Couplets informal who pass of the nobility of its origin and its fate. But you deserve to be exalted to the skies by the couplet in which you humble yourself to the foot of the mount with the coachman of Vertamont. 
footnote a famous coachman who made all the songs of the Pont Neuf back to main text. Any man who will place himself up to the ears in this mud and who will croak such pretty couplets deserves the situation Monsieur Pombonon gives him. This couplet ranks with the best you have ever made. The Countess, whose approbation you always ask, entreats you to believe it. It is charming, it surprises. In short, croak on, and communicate your croaking to us. But good God, what an effusion of blood at Nambour! How many tears, how many widows, and how many afflicted mothers! And they are cruel enough to think this is not sufficient. And they wish that Marshal de Viroy had also beaten, killed and massacred poor Monsieur de Vaudemont. Footnote, Monsieur de Vaudemont made a noble retreat before Marshal de Viroy, who had lost time. Back to main text. What madness! I am uneasy respecting your nephew de Sanse. I pity his mother, it is said she's coming nearer, to wait the event of the siege, which appears to us to be worthy of the fury of the marshal, de Boufflers, who defends it. No opportunity of fighting is lost. Now Germany is very quiet. Our principal anxiety is for her. But no, on account of the Marquis de Grignon, who is in the army of Germany, back to main text. Adieu, my dear cousin. Did I not promise you that my letter would be dull? We have sometimes sorrows, and we know why. I speak of them to Madame de Coulanges. My daughter sends you her remembrances. You have highly amused her by your songs and your chat, for your letter is a true conversation. I have scattered your remembrances in every apartment. They have been received, and they are returned with zeal. I embrace you, my amiable cousin, and exhort you still to spend your time delightfully in honour of polygamy. Would now digest on the subject of Monsieur de Coulanges' second wife, Madame de Louvois, back to main text, which, instead of being a hanging case to you, constitutes all the pleasure and happiness of your life. Letter 13, Guignon, October the 15th, 1695. I have just been writing to our Duke and Duchess de Chaume, but I excuse you from reading my letters. They are not worth reading. I defy all your emphasis, all your points and commas, to produce any good effect. Therefore, leave them as they are. Besides, I've spoken of several little things to our Duchess which are not very entertaining. The best thing you could do for me, my good cousin, would be to send us by some subtle magic all the blood, all the vigour, all the health, and all the mirth which you have to spare, to transfuse it into my child's frame. For these three months she's been afflicted with a species of disorder which is said to be not dangerous, and which I think the most distressing and the most alarming of any. I own to you, my dear cousin, that it destroys me, and that I have not fortitude enough to endure all the bad nights she makes me pass. In short, her last state has been so violent that it was necessary to have recourse to bleeding in the arm. Strange remedy, which makes blood to be shed when too much has been shed already. It is burning the taper at both ends. She has told me so, for in the midst of her weakness and change, Nothing can exceed her courage and patience. If we could regain strength, we should soon take the road to Paris. It is what we wish. And then we would present the Marchioness of Grignon to you, with whom you must already begin to be acquainted on the word of the Duc de Chaune, who has very gallantly forced open her door 
and has drawn a very pleasing likeness of her. Preserve your friendship for us, my dear cousin, however unworthy of it our sorrow may make us. We must love our friends with all their faults. It is a great one to be ill. God grant, my dear friend, that you may escape it. I write to Madame de Coulanges in the same plaintive tone, which will not quit me. For how is it possible not to be ill in mind as this countess, whom I see daily before my eyes is in body? Madame de Coulanges is very fortunate in being out of the scrape. It seems to me as if mothers ought not to live long enough to see their daughters in such situations. I respectfully complain of it to Providence. Letter 14, Grignon, March 1696. Readers note the following letter appears to be from Monsieur de Coulanges in Paris to Madame de Sévigné de Grignon. I know not how the affairs of England go on. The Countess de Fiesque is the only one who has a good opinion of them, and is still certain that they will end well. I have taken three meals at the Marsans, which agree very well with me. We shall put their whole family into my basket. Monsieur de Marsan always reminds his wife that she is no longer Madame de Seignelay, and that being only Madame de Marsan, she must accommodate herself to all his friends, of whatever form or rank, and let every one live after his own way. I am to go on Saturday to St. Martin's, and tomorrow I shall go to Versailles to condole with my friend and pass the day with Madame Villeroy and Mademoiselle de Bouillon, whom I shall find there. Madame de Guise has ordered her funeral to be conducted without ceremony and has preferred the burial ground of the Carmelites of the great convent to all the pomp of Saint-Denis with the kings, her ancestors. She was only forty-nine years of age. Father de la Ferte will preach again on Wednesday, and on Friday, without saying a word, he will set off for Canada. If he were not to take his departure in this way, it would cause a tumult. He is so much liked by the populace. The church of the Jesuits was too small for the multitude which crowded to his sermons. I have just been dining at the Hôtel de Chaune, where I met the Marquis de Grignon. He can tell you that I was not in a very ill humour. Madame la Maréchale de Villeroy yesterday announced to Madame de saint Geron the death of her husband, and the Duke has taken upon himself the charge of the funeral this evening. He will probably be the privileged creditor on the inheritance, for he will advance, no doubt, what is necessary for the ceremony. This is all I know, madam, I therefore conclude, and give leave of you to my return from St. Martin's, which will be when it pleases God. Madame de Coulanges is free from the colic, she only complains that she has sometimes the little colic, which does not prevent her from eating and drinking and associating with the young. She is very partial to the Chevalier de Bouillon and Count d'Abre, and she was delighted to meet Monsieur de Marsan again, with whom she has renewed a snuff acquaintance. Winter has come back within these two days. It has snowed and frozen in such a manner that we must expect no apricots. I fear the peaches also will suffer. Madame de Frontenac has a violent cold and fever. The fashion of dying alarms us for her. Her poor Don Clos has also a slow fever, which returns slightly every evening with a sore throat that makes her friends uneasy. In short, I very much fear that the work of death is not at an end. Letter 15, Grignon, March the 29th, 1696. Footnote. As the death of Madame de Sévigné happened in the beginning of April, it is probable that this letter is the last she wrote. We consider its recovery as a fortunate circumstance. Back to main text. 
When I have no other employment, I weep and bewail aloud the death of Blanchefort, that amiable, that excellent youth, who was held up to all our young people as a model for imitation, a reputation completely established, valour acknowledged and worthy of his name, a disposition happy for himself, for a bad disposition is a torment to its possessor, for his friends and for his family, alive to the affection of his mother and his grandmother, loving them, honouring them, appreciating their merit, taking pleasure in proving to them his gratitude and thereby repaying them for their extreme affection, uniting good sense with the fine person, not vain of his youth, as most young people are, who seem to think themselves paragons of perfection, and this dear boy, with all his perfections, gone in a moment, like a blossom borne away by the wind, without being in battle, without having an opportunity to fight, and without breathing even an unhealthy air. Where, my dear cousin, can we find words to express our ideas of the grief of these two mothers, and to convey to them an adequate sense of what we feel here? We do not think of writing to them, but if at any time should have an opportunity of mentioning my daughter and me and the Grignons, make known a regret of this irreparable misfortune. Madame de Vin has lost everything I own. Footnote, Madame de Vin had lost an only son, back to main text. But when the heart has chosen between two sons, only one is seen. I can talk of nothing else. I bow in reverence to the holy and modest tomb of Madame de Guise, whose renunciation of that of the kings her ancestors merits an eternal crown. I think Monsieur de Saint-Gerain happy indeed, and so I think you, for having to comfort his wife. Say to her, for us, everything you think proper. And as for Madame de Miramion, that mother of the church, she will be a public loss. Readers note, Madame de Miramion, as a rich young widow, had been abducted by Madame de Sévenet's notorious cousin, Bussy Rabatin. He was forced to free her when she refused to take food or water until released. Back to main text. Adieu, my dear cousin. I cannot change my tone. You have finished your jubilee. The delightful trip to St. Martin's has closely followed the sackcloth and ashes you mentioned to me. The happiness Monsieur and Madame de Masson are now enjoying well deserves that you should sometimes see them and put them into your basket, and I deserve a place in that in which you put those who love you. But I fear that for them you have no basket. End of section 48section 49 of the letters of madame de sévigné to her daughter and friends this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain selections from various letters footnote these selections from letters necessarily omitted in our plan comprise nearly if not quite all that is of literary or moral value in the whole series we are thus able to give a more distinct impression of Madame de Sévigné's character as a mother and a Christian. Besides the many amusing anecdotes here collected, her sentiments on important duties of life are of much value, and her religious feelings are deserving distinct recognition. It will be seen that she studied the Bible and strove to follow its divine teachings, like Fenelon, though nominally a Romanist, or rather Jansenist, she had in her heart and mind protested against the corruptions of that church. Her clear insight, just principles, and heart piety are remarkably displayed in these extracts. Back to main text. A Supper 
We supped again yesterday with Madame de Scarron and the Abbé Tetu at Madame de Coulanges. We had a great deal of chat in which you had your share. We took it into our heads to conduct Madame de Scarron home at midnight to the very furthest end of the Faubourg Saint-Germain, a great way beyond Madame de Lafayette's, almost as far as Vaugirard and quite in the country, where she lives in a large, handsome house, the entrance of which is forbidden to everyone, with a large garden and beautiful and spacious apartments. She has an equipage, servants, and a genteel table, dresses neatly but elegantly in the style of a woman who associates with people of rank. She is amiable, handsome, good, free from affectation, and in a word an excellent companion. We returned very merrily in the midst of a number of flambeaux and in full security from thieves. Pour Royal That Pour Royal is a perfect Thebaïs, a very paradise, a desert where all that is left of true Christian devotion is retired. The whole country for a league round breathes the air of virtue and holiness. The nuns are angels upon earth. Mademoiselle de Virtus is wearing out the remains of a miserable life there in the most excruciating pain, but with inconceivable resignation. The very meanest of the inhabitants have a virtuous serenity in their countenances and a modesty of deportment to be met with in no other place. You are always delighted to see this divine solitude of which I had heard so much. It is a frightful valley, calculated to inspire a taste for religion. Hints about children. A word about the little Marquis de Grignon. Footnote, grandson of Madame de Sévigné. Back to main text. I beseech you not to be under any apprehension about his timidity. Remember that the charming de la Chartre used to tremble and quake till he was twelve years old, and that La Troche, when young, was so terrified at the least thing that his mother could not bear to have him in her sight. And yet you see how much they have distinguished themselves since. Let that comfort you. Fears of this kind are the mere effect of childhood, and when childhood is surmounted, instead of being afraid of raw head and bloody bones, these personages are afraid only of being thought fearful, are afraid of being less esteemed than others, and that is sufficient to make them brave and kill their thousands and ten thousands. Let me again beg you to make yourself easy on that score. As to his shape, it is another matter. I would advise you to put him into breeches, and then you will see better how his legs go on, and whether they are straightened as he grows. You must let him have room to stir himself and unfold his little limbs, but you must put on him a pretty tight vest, which will confine his shape. I shall receive some further instructions, however, on this subject, which I will not fail to transmit to you. It would be a fine thing indeed to see a grignon with a bad shape. Do you not remember how pretty he was in his swaddling clothes? I am no less uneasy than yourself at this alteration. Reflections What do you say of death taking the liberty of interrupting fortune is admirable? sort to comfort those who are not in the number of her favourites and to diminish the bitterness of death. You ask me if I am religious. Alas, my dear, I am not sufficiently so, for which I am very sorry, but yet I think I am somewhat detached from what is called the world. Age and sickness give us leisure enough for serious reflection, but what I retrench from the rest of the world I bestow upon you, so that I can make but small advances in the path of detachment. But you know that the law of the game is to begin 
by effacing a little what is dearest to our heart. Versailles in 1676 I was on Saturday at Versailles with the Villars. You know the ceremony of attending upon the Queen at her toilet, at mass and at dinner, but there is now no necessity of being stifled with the heat and with the crowd while their majesties dine. For at three, the King and Queen, Monsieur, Madame, Mademoiselle, the Princes and Princesses, Madame de Montespan, her train, the courtiers and the ladies, in short, the whole court of France, retire to that fine apartment of the King's, which you know. It is furnished with the utmost magnificence. They know not there what it is to be incommoded with heat, and pass from one room to another without being crowded. A game at Erevesis gives a form to the assembly and fixes everything. The King and Madame de Montespan keep a bank together. Monsieur, the Queen and Madame de Soubise, Donjou and Longle, with their companies, are at different tables. The baize is covered with a thousand louis d'or. They use no other counters. I saw Donjou play and could not help observing how awkward others appeared in comparison of him. He thinks of nothing but his game, though he scarcely seems to attend to it. He gains where others lose, takes every advantage. Nothing escapes or distracts him. In short, his good conduct defies fortune. Thus, two hundred thousand francs in ten days. A hundred thousand crowns in a month are added to his account book under the head received. He had the complacence to say I was a partner with him in the bank, by which means I was seated very commodious. I bowed to the king in the way you taught me, and he returned my salutation as if I had been young and handsome. The queen talked to me of my illness, nor did she leave you unmentioned. The duke paid me a thousand of those unmeaning compliments which he bestows so liberally. Monsieur de Lorgue attacked me in the name of the Chevalier de Grignon, and in short, tout de quanti, all the rest. You know what it is to receive a word from everyone who passes you. Madame de Montespan talked to me of Bourbon, and desired me to tell her how I liked Vichy, and whether I had found any benefit there. She said that Bourbon, instead of removing the pain from her knee, had given her the toothache. Her beauty and shape are really surprising. She's much thinner than she was, and yet neither her eyes, her lips, nor her complexion are injured. She was dressed in French point, her hair in a thousand curls, and the two from her temples very low upon her cheeks. She wore on her head black ribbons intermixed with the pearls, which once belonged to the Maréchal de l'Hôpital, diamond pendants of great value, and three or four bodkins. In a word, she appeared a triumphant beauty, calculated to raise the admiration of all the foreign ambassadors. She has heard that complaints were made of her having prevented all France from seeing the king. She has restored him, as you see, and you cannot imagine the delight this has occasioned, nor the splendour it has given to the court. This agreeable confusion, without confusion, of all the most select persons in the kingdom lasts from three o'clock till six. If any couriers arrive, the king retires to read his letters and returns to the assembly. There is always music, to which he sometimes listens, and which has an admirable effect. In the meantime, he chats with the ladies who are accustomed to have that honour. They leave off their game at the hour I mentioned, without the trouble of reckoning, because they use no marks or counters. The pools are of five, six, or seven hundred, and sometimes of a thousand or twelve hundred louis d'or. At six they take the air in caleches. 
the King and Madame de Montespan, the Prince and Madame de Tionge, and Mademoiselle Dedicourt upon the little seat before, which seems to her a seat in paradise. You know how these calèches are made. They do not sit face to face in them, but all look the same way. The Queen was in another with the princesses. The whole court followed in different equipages according to their different fancies. They went afterward in gondolas upon the canal, where there was music. At ten the comedy began, and at twelve they concluded the day with the Spanish entertainment of Medianoche. Thus we passed the Saturday. The Telescope Apropos, did I mention to you an excellent telescope that amused us exceedingly in the boat? It is really a masterpiece of its kind. It is a still better one than that which the Abbe left with you at Grignon. This glass brings objects quite home that are three leagues distance. You may easily guess the use we made of it on the banks of the Loire, but I found a new method of using it, which is this. You know that one end brings objects nearer to you, and the other throws them to a great distance. Now, this end I turn toward Mademoiselle de Plessis, and in a moment I see her three leagues from me. I tried this experiment the other day on her and the rest of my neighbours. This was amusing, but nobody knew what I meant by it. If there had been anyone to whom I could have given a hint, the pleasure would have been greater. When tired with disagreeable company, it is only to send for the glass and look through it at the end that distances the objects. Ask Mungaber if she would not have laughed heartily. This is a pretty subject to talk nonsense upon. If you have Corbinelli with you, let me recommend the use of the glass to you. Adieu, my dear. We are not mountains, as you say, so I hope to embrace you a little nearer than two hundred leagues. But you are going still further off. I have a great mind to set out for Brest. It is very hard, in my opinion, that the Grand Duchess should not have had the good Raray as her Lady of Honour. The Giscards have appointed La Sainte Mim to the office. I hear that La Trousse's good fortune is doubled and that he will have de Frulay's situation. Rules of living. I am never in bed more than seven hours and I eat sparingly. I add to your precepts walking a great deal, but the worst is that I cannot prevent sombre thoughts from intruding into my long, gloomy avenues. Sadness is poison to us, and the source of the vapours. You are right in thinking this disorder is imaginary. You have admirably defined it. It is sorrow that gives birth to, and fear that nourishes it. Work. I was employed yesterday on a piece of work as tedious as the company I had. I never work but when I have company. When I'm alone, I walk, I read or write. La Plessis incommodes me no more than Maria. I'm so happy to have no inclination to listen to anything she says and find as little interruption from her presence as you do from some you have the same kind of regard for. In other respects, she has the best sentiments in the world. I admire how all her good qualities are spoiled by her impertinent and ridiculous manners. It is quite laughable to hear what she says of my patience in bearing with her, how she explains it, and the obligations she fancies it lays her under to attach herself to me, and how I serve her for an excuse for not visiting her friends at Vitre. It would make you smile to observe her little arts to satisfy her vanity. For vanity is the growth of every soil. Her affected fears that I am growing jealous of a nun at Vitre for whom she has a partiality. 
All this would make an excellent farce. Evening employments. I was perfectly rejoiced to return here. I am making a new walk which employs me wholly. I pay my workmen in corn and find nothing so profitable as to amuse oneself and forget, if possible, the evils of life. Neither do my evenings, my child, about which you are so much in pain, hang more heavily on my hands. I'm almost always writing or reading, and midnight overtakes me before I know where I am. Our abbe, her uncle, takes his leave of me at ten, and the two hours that I am alone are no more irksome to me than the rest. In the day I am either employed with the abbe, or among my dear labourers, or in my favourite work. In short, my dear, life flies away so swiftly, and we are always drawing so near our end, that I cannot conceive how people can make themselves so unhappy about worldly affairs. I have here sufficient time for reflection, and it is my fault, and not that of the place, if I do not indulge it. I am quite well. All my people obey you admirably. They are ridiculously careful of me. They come to guard me home in the evening, armed cap a pie, as in pied head to foot, and it is against a squirrel they draw their swords. An impromptu marriage. Monsieur de Chon concluded a marriage the other day which gave me pleasure between the little du Guesclin and a very pretty girl with a large fortune. When he had, with great difficulty, settled the articles, he said, Let us draw up the contract. The parties consented, and he immediately resumed, saying, What prevents their being married tomorrow? and exclaimed, there must be wedding clothes, a toilet, and linen. He laughed at this. Monsieur de Rennes gave a dispensation of two bands, and the next day being Sunday, one was published in the morning, and they were married at noon. After dinner, the little bride danced like an angel. She had learned at Paris of the Duchess's master, and had caught her air. The next day she was Madame de Guesclin, and had saved 20,000 livres that would otherwise have been spent in the wedding. It is consistent with good sense to rise superior sometimes to trifles and customs. End of section 49「Section 50 of the Letters of Madame de Savigny to her daughter and friends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. A Bride Madame de Coulanges informs me that the new Madame de Lafayette was reclined upon a magnificent bed in a noble house. The room hung with beautiful tapestry belonging to the Keeper of the Seals. The bed decorated with an ancient mantle of the order, and the room hung with fine tapestry having the arms ornamented with the staves of the Marshal of France and the collar of the order, looking glasses, chandeliers, glass plates and crystals, according to the present fashion, out of number. A great many servants and valet de chambre in livery, the bride in an elegant dress. In short, such taste reigns in the house of the new married couple and in their family that our Madame de Lafayette ought to be perfectly satisfied at her son's having formed so great and honourable an alliance. Bleeding You tell me you have found it necessary to be bled. The trembling hand of your young surgeon makes me tremble. The prince said one day to a new surgeon, Does not the idea of a bleeding me make you tremble? Faith, sir, replied the man, your highness has most reason to tremble. He was in the right. Company I have for a long time adopted your opinion that bad 
company is preferable to good. How dismal it is to part with the good, and what a pleasure it is to be rid of the bad. Do you remember how we were tormented at Trenal, and how overjoyed we were when the company thought it proper to take their leave? I think we may then establish it as a maxim that nothing is more desirable than bad company, and nothing more to be dreaded than good. Let whoever is puzzled with this enigma call upon us for the solution of it. Quarrels in High Life I think I mentioned to you the quarrel between the Duc de Ventadour and the Duc d'Aumont. The latter was returning from Bourbon with his wife and the Duchess de Ventadour and the Chevalier de Tiade. The Duc de Ventadour was at an estate he has in the same county called La Motte. He had desired his wife to come to him there and sent at the same time to invite the whole company, but was refused. He then came himself, but was ill-received because... Following the company about from dinner time till bedtime, his conversation was mixed continually with menaces and reproaches. In short, he was like Don Quixote, pistol in hand, threatening and challenging the gentleman. The chevalier treated him as a person fit only for bedlam. At length, the ladies arrived in great fear at Paris, where the king being informed of what had happened, sent a guard to take care of Madame Ventadour, so that she is now under the protection of His Majesty. What think you the monster did? He went to the king, attended by his neighbours, that is, the princes de Condé, de Conti, Messieurs de Luxembourg, Duras, Schomberg, Belfond, and with incredible assurance, told the king that the Chevalier de Tirade had not paid him the respect due to his rank. Mark the expression. He places the dukedom where it was formerly. Sire, said he, I want to know why I am refused the company of my wife. What has happened to my person of late? Am I uglier or more ill-made than formerly? when I was as much courted as I am now avoided? If I am ugly, sire, is it my fault? Had I been my own maker, I would have been like your majesty. But these are things that are not in our own disposal. In short, partly owing to this natural and proper, and at the same time unexpected flattery, and partly to the justice of his argument, the king was pleased with him, as well as the whole court. However, they are to be separated. The difficulty is that he insists that his wife shall be shut up at a convent, which is a sad affair. Monsieur de la Rochefoucauld is employed to accommodate this business and to settle matters between the gentlemen. Extravagance of Monsieur de Sévigné. I have been ready to weep to see the desolation of this estate. There were the finest trees in the world upon it, and my son in his last journey gave the finishing stroke to the last. He would even have sold a little copse which was the greatest ornament of the place. Is not this lamentable? He scraped together four hundred pistoles by this plunder, of which he had not a single penny left in a month. It is impossible to think with patience how he acts and what his Brittany journey cost him, withstanding he discharged his coachman and footman at Paris and took nobody but L'Armachin with him. He's found out the art of spending an immense deal of money without making any show for it, of losing without playing, and of paying without discharging his debts. War or peace, 
He is forever crying out for money. In short, he is a perpetual drain. And what he does with his money I cannot conceive, for he appears to have no particular passion. I really think his hand is a crucible which melts money the instant it is put into it. My son writes me word that he is going to play a reversi with his young master. Put note the Dauphin, back to main text. This makes my blood run cold within me. Two, three or four hundred pistols are lost before we can look around us. Quote, this is nothing for a mitos, but a great deal for him. End quote. If people, before they play, would think that they may possibly lose a great deal and that debts of honour must be paid immediately, they would not be so ready to engage in such parties. But the misfortune is that everyone thinks he shall win, and this leads him on to destruction. If Donjo is one of the party, he will carry off everything, for he is a perfect harpy at play. However, it will all turn out as it shall please God. And so it will be with the six thousand francs which I expected to receive from Nantes and which a demon has interfered with in the shape of a point of law that throws us as far back as ever. Gaming they play extravagantly high at Versailles. The hawker, footnote a game at cards, back to main text, is forbidden at Paris under pain of death, and yet it is played at court. Five or six thousand pistols of a morning is nothing to lose. This is no better than picking of pockets. I beseech you to banish this game from among you. The other day the Queen missed going to Mass and lost 20,000 crowns in one morning. The King said to her, Let us calculate, Madam, how much this is in a year. And Monsieur de Montazier asked her the next day if she intended staying away from Mass for the Hawker again, upon which she was in a great passion. I have heard these stories from persons who have come from Versailles and who collect them for me. But now, about this Brelon, footnote a game at cards, back to main text, what folly is it to lose so much money at such a rascally game? It has been banished from us for a downright cutthroat. We do things in a more serious manner. You play against all chance. You lose forever. Take my advice and do not continue it. Consider it is throwing money away without having any amusement for it. On the contrary, you have paid 5,000 or 6,000 francs to be the mere dupe of fortune. But I'm rather too warm, my dear. I must say with Tartuche. "'Tis through excess of zeal. "'I will tell you, my dear child, "'a thought that has occurred to me "'on the frequent losses "'you and Monsieur de Grignon sustain at cards. "'I would have you both be cautious. "'It is not pleasant to be made a dupe of, "'and be assured that it is not natural "'to be perpetually the winner or the loser. "'It is not long since.' I was led into the tricks of the Hôtel de vieux -Ville. You remember, I suppose, how our pockets were picked there. You are not to imagine everybody plays as fairly as you do yourself. The concern I have for your interest makes me say so much, as it comes from a heart entirely devoted to you. I'm persuaded you will not be displeased at it. Providence. You say you never mention Providence, but when you have a disorder on your lungs, 
for as that subject always exhausts mine, for I find none that furnishes so large a field for discussion, observation and inquiry. And why may we not discourse as well on this as on natural philosophy? Why did you still say as you did last year that our fears, our reasonings, our decisions, our wills, our desires are only so many means employed by God for the execution of his purposes? Is this not an inexhaustible subject, fraught with the most entertaining variety? Believe me, there is no experiment in natural philosophy more interesting than the investigation of the connection and diversity of our several sentiments. So that you see, it is God's will may be paraphrased in a thousand different ways. Free will. I have no other answer to make you upon what St. Augustine says except that I hear and understand him when he tells me, and repeats to me five hundred times in the same book, that all things depend, as the Apostle says, quote, not on him that willeth, nor on him that runneth, but on God, that showeth mercy to whom it pleaseth him. That it is not for any merit in man that God bestows his grace, but according to his own good pleasure. That man may not glory in his own strength, seeing he receives all things from God. End quote. His whole book is in this strain, filled with passages from Scripture, the writings of the Apostle Paul, and the homilies of the Church. He calls our free will a deliverance and an aptitude to love God, because we're no longer under the dominion of the devil, and are chosen from all eternity, according to the decrees of the Almighty, before all ages. When I read in this book the following passage, quote, How could God call men to judgment if they were not free agents? Unquote. I confess I am at a loss to understand it, and am disposed to think it a mystery. But as free will cannot put our salvation in our own power, and as we must always be dependent on God, I have no desire to understand it better, and will endeavour as much as possible to remain in a state of humility and dependence. Devices as for devices, my dear child, my poor brain is in a very bad condition for thinking of any, much less for inventing them. However, as there are twelve hours in the day and about fifty in the night, my memory has furnished me with a rocket raised to a great height in the air with these words. Che peri purche sinalsi. Footnote, let it perish, so it be exalted. Back to main text. I'm afraid I've seen this somewhere in the late tournaments, though I cannot exactly say where or when, for I think it too pretty to be my own. I remember also having seen in some book a rocket on the subject of a lover who'd been bold enough to declare himself to his mistress with these words, Da ladore lardire. Footnote, my boldness arises from my ardour. Back to main text. Which is pretty, but does not apply in this instance. I'm not quite sure whether the first I have mentioned is in strict conformity to the rules of devices, for I do not perfectly understand them. All I know is that it pleased me and whether it was in a tournament or on a seal is a matter of no great importance. It is scarcely possible to invent new ones for every occasion. You've heard me a thousand times repeat that part of a line in Tasso, L'alte non temo, I rise without fear. 
back to main text. I used to repeat this so often that the Count de Chapelle had a seal engraved with an eagle flying toward the sun and l'alte non temo for the motto. A very happy device. Monsieur de Montmorin came hither post. Among other things, we were talking about devices. He assures me he does not remember to have seen anywhere the one I proposed. He knew the one with these words, da l'adore la dire, but that is not the thing. The other, he says, is much more complete. Che peri pur che sinalzi, and whether it is my own or borrowed, he thinks it excellent. I have seen a device which suits me exactly. It is a leafless tree, apparently dead, with this inscription round it, Finche so ritorni, footnote, till the sun returns, back to main text. What think you of it, my child? The use of reason. I am still alone, my dear child, without being dull. My health is good. I have plenty of books, work, and fine weather. These, with a little reason, go a great way. Pecuniary embarrassments. You ask why I am not with you. Alas, I could easily answer you if I were inclined to debase my letter with a detail of the reasons that obliged me to quit you, of the misery of this country, the sums that are owing me here, the delays in the payment of them, what I owe elsewhere, and the ruin my affairs must have sustained had I not taken this resolution in time. You well know that I put it off for two years with pleasure, but there are extremes, my dear child, in which we should destroy everything in attempting to wrestle with necessity. The property I possess is no longer my own. I must preserve the same honour and the same probity I have all my life professed. This, this, my child, is the cruel cause that tears me from you. And is this a subject to entertain you with? An obstinate son. In regard to my son, I find I have courage enough to tell him my sentiments without disguise. I wrote him a letter which I think unanswerable, but the more I enforce my reasons, the more he urges his arguments, and he appears so determined that I now perfectly understand what is meant by an unconquerable wish. There is a degree of ardour in the desire which animates him that no prudence can withstand. I cannot accuse myself of having preferred my own interest to his. I wish for nothing but to see him walk in the path I have traced out for him. He is wrong in all his arguments, and far beside the mark. I have endeavoured to set him right by incontestable arguments, corroborated by the opinion of all our friends, and ask him if he has not some doubts, seeing he is alone in an opinion which everyone else disapproves. He answers me always by an obstinate perseverance, so that I am reduced to the last expedient that of keeping him from making a rash or injurious bargain. A Forgiving Mother As I was returning from my walk yesterday, I met the poor frater, footnote her son, back to main text, at the end of the mall, who immediately fell upon his knees, so conscious of having done wrong and having been three weeks underground singing matins, that he thought he dared not approach me otherwise. I had resolved to scold him heartily, but I was so glad to see him that I could not find an angry word to use. You know how entertaining he is. 
He embraced me a thousand times and gave me the worst reasons in the world, which, however, I received as sterling. We chat, we read, we walk, and we wear away the year, or rather what is left of it. Love, its symptoms. You want to know the symptoms of this love of which I spoke to you the other day? In primis, to be the first on all occasions to deny it, to affect an air of great indifference, which is a sure mark of the contrary. The opinion of those who can judge from being near, the public voice, the entire suspension of all motion in the globular machine, a neglect of ordinary concerns to attend to a single one, a continual satirising old people who were so foolish as to be in love. Such nonsense. They must be idiots. Fools. And with a young woman, too. Very pretty, indeed. It would become me mighty well. I had rather break both my arms and legs. And then we make answer internally. Indeed, what you say is very true. But for all that, you are in love. You tell us all these fine things. Your reflections are doubtless very just, very true, very tormenting. But for all that, you are in love. Reason is on your side, but love is stronger than reason. At the same time, you are sick. You weep. You are out of humour. And you are in love. End of section 50、section 51 of the letters of Madame de Savigny to her daughter and friends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chess. You tell me of chess, what I've often thought before. In my opinion, there could not have been contrived a better expedient to humble pride than this game, which at once sets before our view the narrowness and insignificance of the human mind. I think it would be of real utility to anyone fond of such reflections, but then on the other hand, the foresight, the penetration, the address in defending ourselves as in attacking our adversary, the success attending the right management of the game, are so pleasing and afford so much inward satisfaction that it may at the same time nourish our pride and swell our self-sufficiency. I am still far from being cured of this passion and therefore want to be further convinced of my own weakness. Alone. I am delighted to be alone. I walk out, I amuse myself with reading and work, and I go to church. In short, I ask pardon of the company I expect, but I own I do wondrous well without them. A courtier. The other day, the Dauphin was shooting at a mark and shot very wide of it. Monsieur de Montasier rallied him upon it and told the Marquis de Crequy, who is very skilful, to fire, saying to the Dauphin, See how well he will hit the mark. The arch youth had the complaisance to shoot a foot further from it than the Dauphin, which turned the laugh on Monsieur de Montasier. Ah, little wretch, said he, you deserve to be hanged. The king. The king, in reality, is well served. Neither life nor fortune is considered when his pleasure is the question. If we were as well disposed toward God, we should be saints indeed. Christian Humility. I know very well that Jesus Christ, St. Paul and St. Augustine preached and exhorted. It was their business. 
this latter gives good reason for doing so but a poor sinner recovered only three days from a worse state than ours should keep silence penetrated with the mercy of god toward him occupied only with his happiness and the true gratitude he owes to his saviour for having selected and distinguished him from so many others without any merit through free grace such should be the sentiments of his heart and if charity should make him interest himself for his neighbour it should display itself in lamentations before god and in supplicating the same grace for others that has so plentifully been poured upon him such was the penitent and holy princess madame de longueville she did not forget her situation nor the abyss from which god had saved her she preserved the remembrance as a foundation for her penitence and her lively acknowledgment to the almighty thus is christian humility preserved and the grace of jesus christ honoured this does not preclude reflection and christian conversation with our friends but no sermons no scolding these revolt and make us recollect and refer persons to their past life because we find they have forgotten it i am astonished that people of good sense should fall into this injustice but we ought to be astonished at nothing for what do we not meet with in our journey through life home life we need so regular a life that it is scarcely possible to be ill we rise at eight and i often walk till nine when the bell rings for mass to breathe the fresh air in the woods after mass we dress bid each other good day return and gather orange flowers dine and work or read till five since my son's absence i read to save his little wife's lungs leave her at five and return to those delightful groves with a servant who follows me i take books with me change my route and vary my walks from a book of devotion i turn to one of history this creates a little change i think of god and his overruling providence possesses my soul and reflect on futurity at length about eight o'clock i hear a bell this is the summons to supper i prefer this life infinitely to that of Rennes. is it not a fit solitude for a person who should think of her salvation and who either is or would be a christian in short my dearest child there is nothing but you that i prefer to the tranquil repose i enjoy here for i own with pleasure that i would willingly pass some more time with you if it please god liberty at home what do you say my child would you not suffer me to have two or three hours to myself after having been at mass to dinner until five o'clock working or talking with my daughter-in-law she would i believe be as much vexed at this as myself she is a good little woman and we agree wonderfully well together but we have a great taste for the liberty of parting and meeting again afterward when i'm with you my child i own i never leave you but with regret and consideration for you with every other person it is from consideration for myself nothing can be more just or more natural it is impossible to feel for two persons what i feel for you leave us therefore a little to our sacred freedom it agrees with me and by the help of books the time passes in this way as quickly as it does at your brilliant castle readings our readings are delightful we have abadi footnote author of la verite de la religion chrétienne back to main text and the history of the church this is marrying the lute to the voice you are not 
fond of wages. I know not how we could captivate you a whole winter here. You skim lightly. You are not fond of history. And we have no pleasure but when we are attached to our subject and make it a business. Sometimes, by way of change, we read Les Petites Lettres of Pascal. Good heavens, how delightful they are, and how well my son reads them. I constantly think of my daughter, and how worthy of her this extreme propriety of reasoning would be. But your brother says you find that it is always the same thing. Ah, so much the better. Can there be a more perfect style, more finely wrought, more delicate and unaffected raillery, or more nearly allied to the dialogues of Plato, which are so very beautiful? And when, after the first ten letters, he addresses himself to the R.P.s, what seriousness, what solidity, and what force, what eloquence, what a way of supporting it and of making it understood. All this is to be found in the last eight letters, which are very different from the former. I am persuaded you never did more than glance over them, selecting the most beautiful passages, but they should be read leisurely. You ask me what books we are reading. When we have company, reading is laid aside, but before the meeting of the States, we read some little books that scarcely took us up a moment. Mohammed the Second, who took Constantinople from the last emperor of the East. This is a great event, so singular, so brilliant and extraordinary, that we are carried away with it, and it happened but 236 years ago. The Conspiracy of Portugal, which is very fine. The Variations of Monsieur de Maux. A volume of the History of the Church. The second is too full of the details of the councils and therefore might be tedious. The Iconoclast and the Arianism of Meinburg. This author is detestable, his style disagreeable. He is always desirous of being satirical, and compares Alias, a princess and a courtier, to Monsieur Arnaud, Madame de Longueville, and Treville. But setting aside these fooleries, the historical passages are so very fine, the Council of Nice so admirable, that it is read with pleasure. And as he brings us down to Theodosius, we shall find consolation for all our evils in the elegant style of Monsieur de Fléchier. Footnote Esprit Fléchier, Bishop of Nîmes, author of the Life of Theodosius. Back to main text. Arianism. I am at present reading the history of Arianism. I neither like the author nor his style, but the history itself is admirable. It is indeed that of the whole world. It has a share in everything, and seems to have springs that move all the powers of the earth. The genius of Arius was astonishing, as it likewise is to see how his heresy spread itself all over the world. Almost all the bishops join in the error. Saint Anathasius alone stands forth to defend the divinity of Jesus. These great events are truly worthy of admiration. When I wish to feast my understanding and my soul, I retire into my closet. I listen to our fathers and their glorious morality, which makes us so well acquainted with our own hearts. I am employed in reading my Arianism. It is a strange history in which nothing displeases me but the author and the style. But I have a pencil and am revenged on him by marking some passages which I think highly diverting from the earnest desire he shows of drawing parallels between the Arians and the Jansenists, 
and the perplexity he is under to reconcile the conduct of the church in the first ages of christianity and that of the church at present instead of passing slightly over them he says that the church for good reasons does not act now as it did then adoration i find communion is frequent in provence to my shame be it spoken i neglected the immaculate conception of the mother to reserve myself wholly for the nativity of the son for this we cannot be too well prepared jealousy you are doubtless convinced that my sentiments and yours are the same but i want to teach you jealousy at least in theory and assure you credi a me perché l'ho provato for no believe me for i have proved it back to main text that we often say things we do not think and even if we did think them would that be a sign of not loving quite the contrary for if we were to analyse these speeches so full of anger and resentment we should find a great deal of affection and attachment at the bottom some hearts are remarkably delicate when these happen to meet with a cool or indifferent disposition a very considerable progress is made in the region of jealousy this i have thought myself obliged in conscience to say to you make your own reflections upon it for i cannot pretend to enter into particulars at the distance of two hundred leagues folly a young man came to visit me the other day who was the son of a gentleman of anjou with whom i was formerly intimately acquainted at his entrance i beheld a fine graceful handsome figure which struck me with pleasure but alas as soon as he opened his mouth he laughed at every word he spoke which made me almost ready to cry he has a smattering of paris and the opera he sings is familiar and airy and repeats with great gravity quand on a point ce qu'on aime qu'importe qu'importe à quel prix Footnote, to obtain what we do not love back to main text instead of to obtain what we love which you know are the words of the opera i recommend this charming alteration to monsieur de grignon to set it to music the lot of mankind i wish to write in my prayer book what monsieur de comines says of the cross purposes of human life it is pleasant to see that even in his time tribulation and misery were the lot of mankind his style gives peculiar grace to the solidity of his argument for my part i am determined to be more than ever convinced of the impossibility of being happy in this world since god keeps loyally to what he has promised Footnote this is the passage from Camine. no creature is exempt from suffering all eat their bread in pain back to main text expenses retrenchments etc i readily conceive that you are fearful of looking into the expense you have incurred it is a machine that must not be touched lest it fall and crush you with its weight there is something of enchantment in the magnificence of your castle and the elegance of your table the dilapidation must be ruinous and i cannot conceive what you mean by saying that it is not considerable it is a kind of black art like that among courtiers who though they have not a penny in their pockets undertake the most expensive journeys both by land and water follow every fashion are at every ball masquerade and ring in every lottery and still go the same round though overwhelmed in debts 
I forgot to mention gaming, which is another curious article. Then estates dwindle away. But no matter, they still go on. Just so it is with you. I fancy that by this time you were somewhat cured of your grignon economy, where you were to live for little or nothing. For it was nothing, it seems. Nothing at all to have four or five tables, to keep open house and furnish entertainment for man and horse. A thing that no one in the world now thinks of doing. In short, say what you please, that famous caravansera of yours appears to me to teem with ruin. This concourse of people seems to me like the flood which carries all before it. In short, my child, I dare not think of this vortex. Paris will prove your resting place. Stay here, at least, till you have confronted your expenses and can look your return in the face. There are many things yet to settle which concern you as much as myself, and I might as well not have made this journey at all as to make it too short, so that I must resolve to drain the bitter cup to the bottom. Besides, as I observed to you in a former letter, the money I save by being here serves to pay off a part of my debts elsewhere. Without this expedient, what could I have done? You well know what I mean. It has cost me many an uneasy moment. And indeed, what could you yourself have done but for the assistance you received? At present, I fancy, you have made matters up tolerably well. Baptism. What you said the other day as to humour and memory was perfectly just. There are certainly things which are not sufficiently known. I also intend to convict you of heresy, my child, and be as angry as you please. I insist that the death of Jesus Christ is not alone sufficient without baptism. He requires the water, the spirit, and the blood. And it has been on these conditions alone that his death can be of service to us. No part of the old man can enter into heaven but by regeneration through Jesus Christ. If you ask me my reasons, I shall reply with St. Augustine that I can give none, any more than I can tell why having come into the world to save all men, he saves so very few, or why he concealed himself during his lifetime and would not let anyone know or follow him. I can give no reason for all these things, but of this I am certain, that since he thought it fit they should be so, they must be right and proper, seeing that his will is truth and justice. Order. If providence delights in order, and order is no other than the will of God, there must be many things contrary to his will. The persecutions against St. Anathasius and other orthodox divines, and the calm prosperity of tyrants, are all contrary to order, and consequently to the will of God. Therefore, with leave of Father Malbranche, footnote, Father Malbranche says that all that is done in nature is done from the nature of order. Back to main text. Therefore, with leave of Father Malbranche, would it not be as well to confine ourselves to what St. Augustine says, that God permits all things that come to pass, that he may derive glory from them to himself by ways unknown to man. St. Augustine acknowledges no rule or order but the will of God. 
and if we do not follow his doctrine we shall have the mortification of finding that scarcely anything in this world is agreeable to order everything must pass contrary to his will who made all things which in my mind is a shocking supposition end of section fifty one Section 52 of the Letters of Madame de Savigny to her daughter and friends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Mary Blanche. You give me an excellent idea of your eldest daughter. I see her before me. Pray embrace her for me. I rejoice that she is happy. Footnote Mary Blanche, eldest daughter of Madame de Grignon. She was a nun at St. Mary at X, back to main text. The young Marquis de Grignon. Footnote, grandson of Madame de Savigny, back to main text. For your son, you may love him as much as you please. He deserves it. Everyone speaks highly of him and praises him in a way that would give you pleasure. We expect him this week. I felt all the force of the phrase he made use of to gain esteem, quote, which must come or tell the reason why, end quote. It brought tears into my eyes at the moment. But esteem has come already, and will not have to say why it stayed away. The reputation of this child is already commenced and will now only increase. Your son was last night at the Duc de Chartres ball. He was very handsome, and will inform you of his success. You must not, however, calculate upon his studying much. He owned to us yesterday very sincerely that he is at present incapable of paying proper attention. His youth hurries him away, and he does not understand what he reads. We grieve that he has not at least a taste for reading, and that he wants inclination more than time. His frankness prevented our scolding him. I know not what we did not say to him. I mean the Chevalier, myself, and Corbinelli. It was rather warm upon the occasion. But we must not fatigue or force him. This taste will come in time, my dear. For it is not possible that with so much spirit, good sense and love for his profession, he should have no desire to be made acquainted with the exploits of the heroes of antiquity, and particularly Caesar at the head of his commentaries. Have patience and do not fret. It would be too perfect were he fond of reading. I am also of opinion that by reading we learn to write. I know some officers of rank whose style is vulgar. It is, however, a delightful thing to be able to communicate our thoughts. But it also often happens that these people write as they think and as they speak. Everything is in unison. Paulina. Footnote Paulina de Grignon, born in 1674 and married in 1695 to the Marquis de Simian, was noticed at five or six years of age for the agreeableness of her wit as well as the beauty of her person. Her letters were already looked upon as performances in which the pleasing and the natural were equally combined. She had scarcely entered her fourth year when she would occasionally utter repartees full of wit and pleasantry. She was not more than thirteen when she wrote at Madame de Grignon's request a small piece of devotion which the brightest genius might have been proud of. 
it is easy to guess how a person thus favoured by nature must turn out educated under the eyes of a mother and grandmother whose good sense seemed as it were transfused into her she excelled not only in the epistolary style but also in the poetic though she never wrote but for amusement the solid principles of true religion in which she was brought up shone forth in her amid the bustle of courts and secular affairs and never with so much splendour as in the last year of her life which she employed wholly in the exercise of the most sublime virtues of christianity back to main text i am pleased with colonge's praise of paulina it is well applied and makes me understand what sort of charms she possesses curbed however by persons who have not given her the best nose in the world footnote paulina's nose resembled her grandmother's back to main text if the count had given her his fine eyes and fine person and left the rest to you paulina would have set the world on fire she would have been irresistible this pretty mixture is a thousand times better and must certainly form a very pretty personage her sprightliness resembles yours your wit always bore away the palm as you say of hers i like this panegyric she will soon learn italian with the assistance of a better mistress than you had you deserve as excellent a daughter as mine has been i told you that you might do what you wished with yours from her disposition to please you she appears to me worthy of your love paulina then is not perfect i could never have supposed that her chief imperfection would have been ignorance of religion you must instruct her in this which you are very capable of doing it is your duty and you have good books to assist you in return your sister-in-law the abbess will teach her the world you astonish me by what you say of paulina pray pray my dear child keep her with you think not that a convent can repair the errors of education whether as to religion with which the sisterhood are very little acquainted or as to anything else you will do much better at grignon when we have time for application you will make her read good authors you will converse with her and monsieur de lagarde will assist you i am convinced that this is preferable to a convent faith in christ so then you read st paul and st augustine two excellent labourers to establish the absolute will of god they never scruple to assert that god disposes of his creatures as the potter does of his clay some he chooses some he rejects they are at no loss to apologize for his justice since there is no other justice but his will it is justice itself it is the rule of right and after all what does he owe to man is he in any way dependent on him not at all he therefore does them justice in rejecting them on account of the stain of original sin which is communicated to all and he selects a few whom he saves by his son jesus christ who himself says i know my sheep and am known of mine i will lead them forth to the pasture and not one shall be lost i have chosen you saith he in another place to his apostles and you have not chosen me there are numberless passages of this nature i meet with them continually and understand them all and when i find others that seem to contradict them i say to myself 
This is to be understood figuratively, as when we read that God was in wrath, that God repented him, and the like. And I always abide by that first and great truth which represents God to me as he is, the sovereign master, the supreme creator and author of the universe. In a word, as a being infinitely perfect, agreeably to Descartes' idea. Such are my humble and reverential thoughts, from which, however, I deduce no ridiculous consequences, nor do they deprive me of the hope of being of the number of the elect of God, after the mercies he has bestowed on me, which are so many foundations upon which to ground my confidence. The Fire Eater Yesterday a young man came here from Vitre, whom I knew to have lived formerly as footman with Monsieur Coulange. Monsieur de Grignon has seen him at Aix. He showed me a printed list of the feats he performed with fire. He has the secret of a man you've heard spoken of at Paris. Among a thousand wonderful things that he did, and which I'm astonished the government permits, on account of the consequences, I was struck with one in particular which is soon done. This was the letting fall from his hand into his mouth ten or twelve drops of flaming sealing wax, with which he appeared to be no more affected than if it had been so much cold water. He did not make the least grimace or sign of uneasiness, and his tongue looked as fair and unhurt after the operation as before. I've often heard of these fire-eaters, but I must confess that to see the thing performed in my own room and under my very eye struck me with astonishment. Books We pass our time here very quietly. This you cannot doubt, but very swiftly, which will surprise you. Work, walking, conversation, reading, all these are called in to our assistance. Speaking of books, you tell me wonders of Monsieur Nicole's last production. I've read some passages that appear to me very fine. The author's style enlightens, as you say, and makes us enter into ourselves in such a way as discovers the beauty of his mind and the goodness of his heart. For he never scolds out of season, which is the worst thing in the world, and never produces the desired effect. I did not purchase the book at the time, which was in Lent. I contented myself with the good Le Tourneur. Footnote, Nicolas de Tourneur, confessor of Port Royal, so well known by his excellent work entitled The Christian Year, and by a great number of other important works back to main text. We are reading a treatise of the pious man of Port Royal upon continual prayer, which is a sequel to certain pious works that are very fine, but this, which is much larger, is so spiritual, so luminous and so holy, that though it be a thousand degrees above our understandings, it does not fail to please and charm us. We are delighted to find that there have been and still are people in the world to whom God has communicated his Holy Spirit and grace in such abundance. But good heavens, when shall we be possessed of one little spark, of one single degree? How sad it is to find ourselves so far behind here, and so near in other things. Fie, fie, let us not name this misfortune. We ought to humble ourselves at it a hundred times a day. Liberty of mind. There are certain periods of life in which we attend to nothing but ourselves. You, indeed, have never been much occupied in that way. But when we came down this river together, 
who were more engaged in disputing about the Count de Chapelle than in admiring the beauties of the rural scenes that surrounded us. Now the case is exactly the reverse. We observe a profound silence, a perfectly at our ease reading, musing, admiring, out of the way of all sorts of news and living upon our own reflections. The good abbe, her uncle, is always praying. I listen attentively to his pious ejaculations, but when he has got to his beads, I beg to be excused, finding that I can meditate much better without them. In short, we manage to pass twelve or fourteen hours without being very unhappy. Such a fine thing is liberty. The nuns of Saint-Marie. My greatest satisfaction is in visiting the nuns of Saint-Marie. They are truly amiable women. They still retain the remembrance of you, of which they do not fail to make a merit with me. They are neither silly nor conceited like some you know. They do not believe the present Pope to be a heretic. Footnote, Innocent the Eleventh, who passed for favouring the Jansenists, merely because he took no steps against them. Back to main text. They understand the religion they profess and will never reject the Holy Scriptures because they have been translated by worthy men. They pay all due honour to the saving grace of Christ. They acknowledge the power of providence. They educate the young girls committed to their care very properly and neither teach them to lie nor to dissemble. No chimeras, no idolatry is to be found among them. In short, I have a great regard for them. Monsieur de Grignon would think them Jansenists. For my part, I think them Christians. There are two of them who have an infinite deal of wit. I shall go to their house tomorrow to write, and shall dine with them on Saturday. They are all the comfort I have here. Moral Essays Do you not intend to read the moral essays and give me your opinion of them? For my part, I am charmed with them. And so I am with the funeral oration on Monsieur de Touraine. There are passages in it which must have affected all that were present. I do not doubt but it has been sent you. Tell me if you do not think it very fine. Do you not intend to finish, Josephus? We read a great deal of serious as well as lighter subjects, fable and history. We are so deeply engaged with these that we have scarcely leisure for any other employments. They pity us at Paris. They think us confined to a fireside by the inclemency of the season and languishing under a dearth of amusement. But, my dear, I walk. I find a thousand diversions. The woods are neither wild nor inhospitable. It is not for passing my time here instead of at Paris, that I am to be pitied. History of the Bible. I am, moreover, reading the emblems of the Holy Scriptures. Footnote, History of the Old and New Testament by Monsieur de Sassy, Sir de Roamont. He composed this book in the Bastille. It is, they say, filled with allusions to the vicissitudes of Jansenism in that age. Monsieur de Sathy was president of the nuns at Port-Royal, back to main text. The emblems of the Holy Scriptures, which begin from Adam. I have begun with the creation of the world, which you are so fond of, and shall end with the death of our Saviour, which you know is an admirable series. We find in it every circumstance, though related concisely. The style is fine. It is done by an eminent hand. The history 
is interspersed throughout with excellent reflections taken from the fathers and is very entertaining for my own part i go much further than the jesuits and when i see the reproaches of ingratitude and the dreadful punishments with which god afflicted his people i cannot help concluding that we who were freed from the yoke to which they were subjected are in consequence highly culpable and justly deserve those scourges of fire and water which the almighty employs when he thinks fit the jesuits do not say enough on this subject and others give cause to murmur against the justice of the deity in weakening the supports of our spiritual liberty as they do you see what fruit i derive from my reading i fancy my confessor will enjoy me to read the philosophy of descartes affection i fancy myself qualified to write a treatise on affection there are a thousand things depending on it a thousand things to be shunned in order to prevent those we love from smarting for it there are innumerable instances where we give them pain and in which we might alleviate their feelings were we to reflect and to turn things in all the points of view we ought out of regard to the object of our love in short i could make it appear in my book that there are a thousand different ways of proving our regard without talking of it as well as of saying by actions that we have no real regard even when the treacherous tongue is making protestations to the contrary i mean no one in particular but what i have written i have written submission i beg you will read the second part of the second treatise in the first volume of the moral essays i'm sure you know it but you may not perhaps have observed it particularly it is on the subject of submission to the will of god you will there see how clearly it is demonstrated that providence governs all things that is my creed by that i abide and though a contrary doctrine may be advanced elsewhere to keep fair with all sides i shall consider such conduct only in the light of a political stratagem and follow the example of those who believe as i do though they may change their note philosophy you say that i make god the author of everything that happens read read i say that part of the treatise i have pointed out to you and you will find that we are to look to him for everything but with reverence and humility and consider man only as the executor of his orders from his agency he can draw what effects he thinks proper it is thus we reason when our eyes are lifted up to heaven but in general we are apt to confine our views to the poor contemptible second causes that strike our bodily senses and bear with impatience what we ought to receive with submission but such alas is my present wretched situation i join with you in believing that philosophy is good for little except to those who do not stand in need of it you desire me to love you more and more indeed you embarrass me i know not where to find that degree of comparison it is beyond my conception but this i am certain of that i never can in thought word or deed evince a thousandth part of the affection i bear you and this it is that sometimes distracts me old age so then you were struck with an expression of madame de lafayette's quote, you are old unquote, blended with so much friendship though i say to myself that this is a truth which should not be forgotten 
I confess that I was all astonishment at it. For I yet feel no sort of decay that puts me in mind of it. I cannot, however, refrain from calculating and reflecting, and I find that the conditions of life are very hard. It seems to me that I have been dragged against my will to the fatal period when old age must be endured. I see it, I have attained it, and I would at least contrive not to go beyond it, not to advance in the road of infirmities, pain, loss of memory, disfigurements, which are ready to lay hold of me. And to hear a voice which says, you must go on in spite of yourself, or if you will not, you must die, an alternative at which nature recoils. Such, however, is the fate of those who have reached a certain period. I contemplate this evil, which has not yet proved itself so, with heroic courage. I prepare myself for its consequences with peace and tranquillity, and seeing that there is no way to escape, and that I am not the strongest, I think of the obligation I owe to God for conducting me so gently to the grave. I thank him for the desire he daily gives me to prepare for death, and the wish of not draining my life to the dregs. Extreme old age is frightful and humiliating. The good Corbinelli and I see a painful instance of this truth hourly, in the poor Abbé de Coulanges, whose helplessness and infirmities make us wish never to reach this period. Sermons, when I am as good as Monsieur de Lagarde, if ever God grants me this grace, I shall like all sermons. In the meanwhile, I content myself with the Gospels as explained by Monsieur Le Tourneur. These are real sermons and nothing but the vanity of man could load modern discourses with their present contents. We sometimes read the homilies of St. John Chrysostom. These are divine, and please us so highly that I persist in not going to Wren till Passion Week to avoid being exposed to the eloquence of the preachers who hold forth in behalf of the Parliament. The Marshal de Guamont was so transported the other day at a sermon of Baudelieu's that he cried out in the middle of a passage that struck him, By dash, he is right. Madame burst out laughing, and the sermon was interrupted so long that nobody knew what would be the consequence. If your preachers are as you represent them, I'm apt to think they would be in no great danger of their being interrupted by such praises. Josephus. I'm glad you like Josephus, Herod and Aristobulus. I beg you to go on and see the end of the siege of Jerusalem and the fate of Josephat. Take courage. Everything is beautiful in this historian. Everything is grand. Everything is magnificent. Everything is worthy of you. Let not an idle fancy prevail with you to lay him aside. I am in the history of France. That of the Crusades has occasioned my looking into it, but it is not to be compared with a single leaf of Josephus. Alas, with what pleasure we weep over the misfortunes of Aristobulus and Mariamne. Hope ever. We should never despair of our good fortune. I thought my son's situation quite hopeless, after so many storms and shipwrecks, without employments and out of the way of fortune, and while I was indulging these melancholy reflections, Providence destined, or had destined us, to so advantageous a marriage that I could not have wished for a better alliance, even at the time when my son had the greatest reason to expect it. It is thus we grope in the dark, 
not knowing our way, taking good for evil and evil for good in entire ignorance. Twilight I hate twilight when I have nobody to chat with. I'd rather be alone in the woods than alone in a room. This is like plunging up to the neck in water to save oneself from the rain, but anything rather than an armchair. A presentiment. Good heavens, my dear child, what fools your women are, both living and dead. Your top knots shock me. Footnote. It was the custom in Provence to bury the dead with their faces uncovered, and the women, who wore ribbons as a headdress, retained them in their coffins. Back to main text. What a profanation! It smells of paganism. Pfft. It would make me shudder at the thoughts of dying in Provence. I would at least be assured that the milliner and the undertaker were not sent to her at the same time. Fie, fie. Fie, fie, indeed. But no more of this. Footnote. This passage might deserve the name of presentiment. All she feared came to pass. She died in Provence, and the very headdress which was so repugnant to her mind adorned her in her coffin. End of section 52your politeness, sir, need not lead you to fear the renewal of my grief in speaking to me of the afflicting loss I have sustained. Footnote, Madame de Savigny, it appears, died early in April. Back to main text. This is an object which my mind bears constantly in view, and which is so deeply engraven in my heart that nothing has power to increase or diminish it. I am convinced, sir that you could not have heard the dreadful misfortune which has happened to me without shedding tears. I can answer for your heart. You lose a friend of incomparable merit and fidelity. Nothing is more worthy of your regret. And what, sir, do I not lose? What perfections were not united in her to me by different characters, most dear and most precious? A loss so complete and so irreparable leads me to seek for consolation only in the bitterness of tears and groans. I have not strength to raise my eyes to the place whence comfort flows. I can yet only cast them around me, and I no longer see the dear being who has loaded me with blessings, whose attention from day to day has been occupied in adding fresh proofs of her love to the charms of her society. It is too true, sir, that it requires more than human fortitude to bear so cruel a disunion and so much privation. 
I was far from being prepared for it. The perfect health I saw her enjoy, and a year's illness, which a hundred times endangered my own life, had taken from me the idea that the order of nature could be fulfilled by her dying first. I flattered myself that I should never have this great evil to endure. It has come upon me, and I feel it in all its severity. I deserve your pity, sir, and some share in the honour of your friendship, if sincere esteem and high veneration of your virtue can deserve it. My sentiments have been the same toward you since I had the pleasure of knowing you, and I believe I have more than once told you that it is impossible for any one to respect you more than I do. Letter 2 from Monsieur de Coulange to Madame de Simiane. Footnote the dear Pauline, the favourite granddaughter of Madame de Sevigné, back to main text. Paris, May the 25th, 1696. Far from taking it unkindly, madam, that you did not write to me with your own hand, I am very much surprised that you even thought of me at a time so cruel and so fatal as the present. I did not doubt your sensibility at the loss we have sustained, and I could easily conceive what it would cost your excellent heart. God of heaven, what a blow is this to us all! For myself, I am lost in the thought that I shall no longer see the dear cousin to whom I have been from infancy so affectionately attached, and who returned this attachment so tenderly and so faithfully. If you could see, madam, all that passes here, you would be still better acquainted with the merit of your grandmother, who never was worth more truly acknowledged than hers, and the public renders her with pious regret all the honour which is due to her. Madame de Coulanges is grieved to an excess that it is impossible to describe, and I tremble for its effect upon her own health. From the day that announced to us the fatal illness, which in the end took our friend from us forever, we have lost all peace of mind. The Duchess de Chon is almost dead, and poor Madame de la Troche. In short, we meet together to weep and to regret what we have lost, and in the midst of our grief we are not without anxiety for the health of your mother. Do not write to me. Order one of your meanest attendants to inform us how you are. I entreat you to believe that your mother's health and your own are very precious to me, for more reasons than one, for I think I owe it to the memory of Madame de Sevigny to be more attached to you and Madame de Grignon than before, from knowing so well the sentiments she entertained for her and for you. I shall not write to your mother for a long time, for fear of increasing her grief by my letters, but omit me not, whenever an opportunity offers, make mention of my name. Be assured that of all your servants, relations, friends, no one is more deeply afflicted than I am. No one feels a greater interest in all that concerns you. I shall not show your letter immediately to Madame de Coulange, but I shall not fail to tell her that you do not forget her. I can assure you that you owe her this justice on account of her love for you. Allow me to pay my sad compliments to Monsieur de Simian, the Chevalier de Grignon, and Monsieur Lagarde. Heavens, what a scene in this royal chateau! Poor Mademoiselle de Massiac, too, who has so well discharged all the duties of friendship. How I feel for her! Letter 3 From Madame de Coulanges to Madame de Simian Paris, May the 2nd, 1696 I am truly obliged to you, madam, for still thinking of me. 
I knew all your excellences, but the affection of your heart, and the regard you felt for a person so worthy of being beloved as she whom you regret, appear to me to be above all praise. Ah, madam, how much reason have you to believe me to be deeply affected? I can think of no other subject. I can talk of nothing else. I am ignorant of the particulars of this fatal illness, and the eagerness with which I seek for them shows that I have little power over myself. I spent the whole of yesterday with the prior of St. Catherine's. You may guess upon what our conversation turned. I showed him the letter you have done me the honour to write to me. It gave him real pleasure, for persons of his turn of mind are so convinced that this life ought only to serve as a passport to the other, that the dispositions in which we leave the world are to them the only ones that are worthy of attention. But we think of what we have lost, and we lament it. For myself I have no female friend left. My turn will come soon. It is reasonable to expect it, but to hear a person of your age entertain such serious and melancholy thoughts is rare indeed. Your understanding, madam, makes me forget your youth, and this added to the natural partiality I feel for you seems to authorise me to address you as I do. Letter 4 from the Count de Grignon to Monsieur de Coulanges Grignon, May the 23rd, 1696 You, sir, can understand better than any one the magnitude of the loss we have sustained and my just grief. Madame de Sévigné's distinguished merit was perfectly known to you. It is not merely a mother-in-law that I regret. This name does not always command esteem. It is an amiable and excellent friend, and a delightful companion. But it is a circumstance more worthy of our admiration than our regret that this noble-minded woman contemplated the approach of death, which she expected from the moment of her attack, with astonishing firmness and submission. She, who was so tender and so timid, respecting those she loved, displayed the utmost fortitude and piety when she believed that she ought to think only of herself. And we cannot but remark how useful and important it is to fill the mind with good things and sacred subjects, for which Madame de Sévigné appears to have had a peculiar taste, not to say a surprising avidity, by the use she made of these excellent provisions in the last moments of her life. I relate these particulars to you, sir, because they accord with your sentiments, and will be gratifying to the friendship you have borne for her whom we lament. At the same time, my mind is so full of them that it is a relief to me to find a man so well disposed as you are to listen to the recital and to take pleasure in hearing it. I hope, sir, that the memory of a friend who highly esteemed you will contribute to preserve to me the regard with which you have long honoured me. I prize it too highly and wish it too much, not to deserve it a little. End of section 53 End of the letters of Madame de Sévigné to her daughter and friends